welcome to this episode of Heterodox History. Today we are going to be discussing the Kingdom of Heaven and what I've termed the perils of presentism. This is of course the Ridley Scott film from 2005. I am very lucky to be joined by Columba. Hello. Yes, also known as Columba Dean. I am glad to be back um, for one of these um, movie, movie reviews. <laughs> Our last one was pretty explosive if I recall. Yes, of course, referring to Braveheart, and uh, we may be alluding to that on stream as well, especially with my absolute loathing for this film, which we'll get into. And uh, Furious Pertinax, hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, or shall I say, welcome to Jerusalem. Yeah. The place for all men, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> the total uh, deconstruction of Jerusalem as we go through the plot of this film. Yes, so indeed. anyway, just a proviso, we are reviewing the director's cut of the film. I feel it only fair that we review the best supposed iteration of the film out there and the one that Ridley Scott would have us watch rather than the theatrical release. Um, there are many aspects which, again, improve the film, but there are many aspects which doom the film even further. Yes, uh, and whereas just, people talk about it as if it sort of saves it, which couldn't be further from the truth. No, all, all the problems that exist in the theatrical view, uh, in, the, in the theatrical version of the film are... Some are somewhat remedied, but all the problems from the theatrical view, uh, the theatrical uh, version of the film, uh, remain, persist, and we'll talk about them now. Now, I have a couple of quotes regarding uh, the historical reception that the film received uh, when it came out, which uh, wasn't positive. They did, I believe, manage to find a couple of uh, quote unquote medievalists who were able to uh, try and defend the film in the, uh, mm. uh, the behind the scenes footage that you have on the DVD. Uh, but one uh, review uh, came to mind, which is from Jonathan Riley Smith of the University of Cambridge who wrote, Kingdom of Heaven will feed the preconceptions of Arab nationalists and Islamists. The words and actions of the Muslim Brotherhood and the picture of Palestine as a Western frontier will confirm the nationalists that the medieval crusading was fundamentally about colonialism. colonialism. On the other hand, the fanaticism of most of the Christians in the film and the hatred of Islam is what the Islamists want to believe. It's Osama bin Laden's version of history. Now I'm going to push back against this slightly and say this isn't Osama bin Laden's version of history. Rather, this is the John Lennon's imagine iteration mm, of history mm. it is a fundamentally <laughs> modern uh post-religious uh deconstructionist attitude which has elements of muslim sympathy often sort of rooted in the uh the sort of post-christian nihilism that we see affecting the west and of course we, one can't uh remove the kingdom of heaven from its historical context in that this was a film made just after the 2005 invasion. yes 2005 just after the invasion of iraq four years of cool down since 9 11 and a lot of the chattering classes are now becoming more and more, more opposed to the neoconservative foreign policy of george bush and tony blair and of course this is reflected in the fact that the war on terror at the time was directed mainly at or almost exclusively at islamic terrorism Yes, but there is also that angle of, um, um, you know, both sides are wrong, war is senseless um, at all times. Yeah, you have the classic, I suppose that's the John it's, Lennon again, isn't but, it? But, but, but not, not to be in the on bro, it's like war is senseless, but these people doing this are slightly more moral than those people doing this, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yes. there's, always that, there's always that sort of twist in the knife of that narrative, like, oh, war is bad, but, you know, but... Yes, and the, the perfect way to sum up the anachronism that is uh, Kingdom of Heaven, if you are to try and place this in a historical setting, and why presentism is the best sort of explanation as to why this film fails, uh, Bailey Neviblin is talking, making a speech, trying to rouse the uh, beleaguered defenders of Jerusalem in the wake of Salah al-Din, and he declares, what is Jerusalem? Your holy places lie over the Jewish temple that the Romans pulled down. The Muslim places lie over yours. Which is more holy, the wall, the mosque, the sepulchre? Who has claim? No one has claim. All what, what claim. Christian knight says this? That's the and point. Then the, and, and then the United Nations stood and clapped. Yes, and the United <laughs> Nations stood and clapped. And my, my moniker for this evening, Heraclius, declares rightfully, that is blasphemy. And Balian's retainer declares, be quiet. This is utter nonsense. He, not only would Balian have probably been stoned and lynched on the spot yeah. for saying that, but he would right. have been lynched on the spot if he said that today in Jerusalem. Yeah. The, yeah. This isn't yeah, just a problem with presentism. This is a problem with a liberal mm -hmm. deconstructionist who can't see the value in all religion. So wouldn't it be nicer if, oh, we all just got along? And of yeah, course, this, this is relativism. Yeah. Yes, this is. Uh, and I've been. Uh, 
reading a lot of Leo Strauss at the moment, and he talks a lot about historicism of relativism, and his contention is that relativism is fundamentally progressive, because in order to assume a relativistic point of view, it implies that one has an understanding and appreciation of values which supersedes all those who had absolute view mm. that systems of, or universal conceptions of viewpoints. Uh, of and course. that is... Of course, that's quite ironic because I want Strauss's ideas wormed their way into the neoconservative circles, did they not? Yes, uh, but that's uh, another point really to, yes. to get into. Uh, and of course, uh, this point is substantiated when, again, erroneously, Balian suggests to Salah al-Din that he'll tear down the Christian holy sites, everything that drives men mad. So there is a distinct anti-religious sentiment which runs through this film and it is imposed because this is in no way coming from the historical character of Bailey Nivibelin. Everything about this character is anachronistic. And I think without further ado, we'll actually uh, go through this film uh, bit by bit and uh, investigate how virtually every single aspect of this film is wrong. And I, just to pre preface this, what makes this film more insidious is that there is genuine history behind it. However, every little element of truth, every detail which correlates to some form of historical fact, there is an important omission or there is some form of subversion. The screenwriter of this film is William Moynihan, and he defends this subversion or point of omission, saying that it wasn't that he was unaware of the details, rather he was simply following in a literary tradition which began with Shakespeare. So to put away his vanity <laughs> for a yeah. moment to try and justify that, uh, the two sources which uh, he uh, essentially it's very obvious he uh, looked at in order to uh, formulate the screenplay for this film. Uh, one was the Histoire d'Héraclis, uh, the history of Heraclius, uh, the old French continuation of William of Tyre, uh, which is a fragmented history and again the indication of William of Tyre. William of Tyre of course was a contemporary of the uh, events and figures in Jerusalem and he was very much on the side of Baldwin IV and the House of Ibelin. Uh, so there is always already a hint in William of Tyre which is anti-figures such as Guy de Lusignan and uh, mm. Reynaud of Chatillon. Uh, but this is only uh, further sort of extended with the fragmentary account of the Estoire de Heracles. Um, however, there is also the uh, Sir Walter Scott uh, novel from the Waverley series, uh, The Talisman, and many aspects of that book, which again isn't in, in, in any way sort of historically relevant to this period because this is a account of the Third Crusade, uh, many of the character personalities and plots are actually superimposed retroactively to fit in uh, with the story mm -hmm. of the fall of Jerusalem as well. Uh, so with that in mind, as opposed to the, the two sort of fundamental inspirations for the history, of uh, this account of the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, we'll get into it. We've already elucidated what the overall message of the film is, um, is and how everything is uh, forced in a way to yeah. uh, emphasize that message. And the film begins by talking about the hundred years since the seizure of Jerusalem. And the beginning title says that Europe suffers in the grip of repression and poverty. Peasant and Lord alike flee to the Holy Land in search of fortune or salvation. Yeah. Now, this, this, is a... this is this is so crude. I mean, because at one point, I think one of the characters, it might be Tiberius, it might be Godfrey, they actually call um, the Holy Land a new world. And so you can already see, I mean, that is the most American um, um, manifest destiny interpretation that you can come to, you know, and there's it's just absurd. Also, also, it's a case of sort of superimposing uh, historical amnesia on this time period. Uh, just, I mean, most of our viewers would know this, and I know you two do as well, but um, the place in France where this occurs, where, um, well, in the director's cut, where they sort of, you know, the uh, Godfrey and his, re you know, his retainers um, enter the ca uh, castle of the, the brother of Godfrey, who's the Lord in France. Uh, this place in France and Jerusalem were... Um, shall I say, 600 years before, were part of actual the same political entity, which is the Roman Empire. And people in France would have known that. You know what I mean? Uh, it, and that kind of sense of scope is immediately obliterated with that line in my mind. Well, well there is an aspect to which, I mean, my issue is repression and poverty. That line seems too vague and also, again, sort of sets the, uh, sets the sort of imagination of the viewer on fire. Uh, because yeah. the idea of grip of repression and poverty, 
um, is this just a post enlightenment view which is being superimposed on the on the medieval ages in a uh, ambiguous way so as to mm. elicit a certain response from the audience without actually having to own it or interrogate it in any satisfying manner and this of course is what the film mm. does it yes, it's, starts it's off, it doesn't that, um, it doesn't elucidate it at all it, we, uh, we yes. might we might call it a trope actually of the middle ages which persists to this time particularly amongst those circles who believe that about the middle ages where they're sort of dark and everyone's dying of leprosy and no one lives past the age of 35 it's just another trope of the Middle Ages, which is very much untrue and magnified beyond reason. Yes, precisely. And uh, it re this film relies on every single trope when referring to uh, this uh, debunking of any sort of validity uh, of medievalism. And of course, peasant and lord alike flee to the Holy Land in search of fortune and salvation. We'll get into what that means in, in the future, because of course, that very much sort of uh, focuses on your point, Columba, uh, which is the idea of a reactionary sort of post-Napoleonic Europe, when everyone is fleeing to America, the land of uh, yeah. freedom and opportunities. So yes, even though Ridley Scott is English, uh, there is an aspect of Americanism which is feeding into this idea of uh, in search of fortune, salvation, redemption, and but again, all of this is deconstructed. If I'm going to point to one sort of central theme, uh, which the Kingdom of Heaven tries to get across, is it is a complete refutation of the validity of the Crusades as a means of salvation. And this is why we have to have a completely fictionalized version of Balian of Ibelin in particular, because he is the man who surrenders Jerusalem. But he doesn't surrender Jerusalem for the historical reasons that he does know. Balian of Ibelin has to surrender Jerusalem as giving up on the notion of salvation via the Crusades and yeah. embracing the cynical, nihilistic, secular mindset that he begins the film with. And um, just to, to illustrate that, the film begins very darkly where we have the suicide of his wife ostensibly grieving after the loss of a child. And we have one of uh, many characters introduced into the story where I I'm going to describe them as being dogmatically religious in the way that the film tries to display religion, whilst also being malicious and insincere. Yeah. And, this and we is... should also know, um, just you know, on, a on, a, on a cinematography level, I mean, everything is you know, blued out, greyed out, it's depressing, yes. it's cold, it's winter. Purpose, yes. yes. Wet and yes. moist. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, this is, this is meant to be, you know, like the middle of France, isn't it? Um, which even in winter, it's very, it's very bright, you know. Um, it's just, it, it's so, it's so shocking if you actually, because if you peer into this period, the 1200s or the 1100s, um, there's a lot of um, cheer, you know. I mean, you have the beginnings of the, uh, you know, you have troubadour music, Richard well, the look Lionheart. Up, look at, look at the, um, look at, look it's at a the period that was left. loved. Look at, this is the, I, I included this image, this is the construction of Chart Cathedral. Post the beginning of the Crusades, we enter a period which is, again, modern historic refers to as the 12th century Renaissance. And again, what this film would find completely baffling is that this is spurred on by the Crusades. Not only yeah. the Crusades in the Levant, the Crusades in Spain, and the interaction with the Byzantine Empire and the West in general. So what we're seeing is a great intellectual, architectural, artistic outpouring in Europe. And all of this is omitted in the film to portray, again, emphasizing Ridley Scott, Scott is, of course, the director of Gladiator, and the impression I get of Loire Castle, by the way, isn't, which is the castle featured in the film, isn't in France, it's in uh, Spain, mm -hmm. in uh, Aragon. The impression I get is very similar to Ridley Scott's aesthetic of Vindabonum in Gladiator, where everything is drag, dank, and al yeah. almost seemingly barbaric. And the period I get from this film isn't so much the 12th century, but it's almost sort of Carolingian. Um, in terms mm -hmm. of the desperation, the poverty, and the again the the relative isolation, the lack of any economy, um, all of these films are uh, things which are held in contradistinction uh, when we arrive in Jerusalem, and even the would, color, I, I, the color scheme changes. But, but I would say I would say more than that because if you if you look at um I think it's once he goes to Ibelin and he goes to his castle, um and also I just want to say I agree with you about your point there about um um the Crusades and the interaction with the East fueling this we've talked about this um um you know the Vesely Abbey which was built I think eleven twenty to eleven fifty um has um you know arches with black and white tiles very similar to what you would have seen in the East so you know you see these inspirations um um coming in there don't you. 
Yes, absolutely. And um, all of this is purposely omitted from the film. And this is where we get to the plot, which is introducing this priest, Michael Sheen character, uh, because, again, he has to demonstrate this trope of dogmatic religiosity. Um, he follows the letter of the law and decapitates the corpse of Orlando Bloom's wife, who later turns out to be Bailey in the Biblin. And the purpose of this, because again, I, I looked into the, the notion of suicide, and this did take place. Uh, whether it took place at this time in France is another matter, but definitely took place in England and parts of Germany. Another yes, practice but this was more was sort of into the, um, the sort of 15, 1600s, wasn't it? Uh, yes, there were there were laws which were created in the medieval era, but in terms of the actual enforcement of the laws, uh, we see a revival of this in the early modern period. And uh, we also see the harshest pronouncements in France were actually during the medieval period. They were during the reign of Louis XIV, where a suicide had all of his property forfeited and, and essentially escheated back to the crown. Mm. And the purpose of this was to dis disincentivize suicide, but also it's adopting the idea that suicide isn't, again, in any way sort of progressive would see it suicide is an act of self-murder so there needs to yes. be some form of punishment and one of the reasons specifically as to why there was the idea of a beheading of a corpse and again it's a medieval superstition it's this idea that a headless corpse or some sort of evil spirit wouldn't haunt over uh the bodies of sort of good earnest christians either well yes so there's there's, there, there, there are sort of reports um of sort of staking certain bodies aren't there? yes um and also um Yes, they wouldn't be afforded a proper burial um, in a burial um, site next to St. Yes, Kurt. the most universal aspect of this, which is we can all agree on, is that a suicide would have been posthumously excommunicated and wouldn't have been allowed to be buried in consecrated ground, receiving yes. a Christian burial. Um, but nevertheless, my issue of that isn't necessarily the depiction of the uh, the way that sort of Michael Sheen goes about this. Uh, my frustration comes from the fact that he almost gloats about this to Orlando Bloom. He wants, for some reason, we don't know enough about the character to understand why, he wants Orlando Bloom to go to the Holy Land to seek redemption uh, because he keeps emphasizing his wife is in hell and that she is without a head and that... And, and to this remark, he smiles. And this, again, emphasizes the fact that none of these characters can actually believe this with any sort of sincerity. They mm. pursue this dogmatic religious line because they're just bastards. <laughs> this yeah, is a continuous yeah. line they, they that you see something. with all with all of the dogmatically religious characters. I, I, I forgot, by the way, um, before I started rambling on about Vesely, the thing which slipped my mind is so they went to Ibelin and you have this um motif um going along the wall which says, quod sumus um hoc editis which is meant to be like um you know such as you are like such as you will be um and it's it's the famous sort of dance of death motif which i mean i don't know if that would have been in um um, um the east at that time um certainly there's not even much evidence that it would have been in the west in the 1100s the dance of death of seeing sort of you know um kings or jesters or whoever as skeletons um um this this pretty much came into popularity around the time of the black death and I do think that um, in the mind of the average person, and certainly in the mind of many people in Hollywood as well, um, that period of Europe, you know, the grimmest era, era of the Black Death, that is the Middle Ages for them. And there's nothing else. Um, yes. So I just wanted yeah. to bring that up as well. Sorry. I just point out this is 160 years before the Black Death, which happens yes, in the yes. 14th century. Uh, but here we come to the greatest sort of anachronistic aspect of the period, which is introducing Godfrey of Ibelin, played by Liam Neeson, um, who again seems to be on his own quest for redemption, uh, declaring that he is a murderer in you know, response to Orlando Bloom, that we are all murderers. Um, and again, you know, this idea that he will claim a son. Um, and hope that the sun will essentially do his bidding. Um, as for this, there is no historical parallel uh, at all because Godfrey of Ibelin is actually the age of the historical Balian of Ibelin at this time, and none of this happened. Balian of Ibelin is not a bastard, and this is the fundamental sort of uh, crutch of this story, and it's something we really can't get into historically. It is this idea that a character who, again, surrenders Jerusalem has to be disillusioned. He has to have a mission of redemption. He has to go to Jerusalem and he has to reject that Christian conception of redemption. 
all, and again, almost returned to the place where he began, having learned nothing <laughs> from this experience, having mm -hmm. explicitly re re rejected the validity of the Crusades. So it is therefore, for the film's message to come across, it is necessary yeah. for Balian to start off like mm -hmm. this. However, it destroys the historical validity of this, because this very act makes the entire character journey impossible. Not just unfeasible, impossible in terms mm -hmm. of his rise through the ranks of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, but also in terms of his skill set and his development as a character. All of this is impossible. And it fundamentally derails every, everything else from the film. Mm -hmm. But again, this isn't the sole issue. This is simply the highest order of <laughs> issues upon which uh, <laughs> there is an omni shambles yeah. we, which we need to go into. It, it definitely lays the groundwork of him, firstly, being sort of a project, in as much as that he's cynical sitting, sitting and disillusioned. The way that his sort of character, he's sort of falsely catapulted up the ranks of 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 worth and nobility and trustworthiness within the kingdom. Uh, this uh, dishonest origin story, like you say, is fundament fundamental to that. But one point, uh, actually rather two minor points I just want to raise before we move on from France and the village is, and this is where the, there's a discrepancy between the director's card and like the, the th theatrical release. And I, th and I think it's an important distinction because I don't know whether there's a, sub, like, a, a, a more nuanced reasoning for this, but just for the sake of us talking about it, in the in the uh, the theoretical release, the bastardry is kind of more implied of Balian. Like it's not necessarily. Well, I mean, I mean, you can guess it, but it's not crystal clear in the director's cut. It is extremely explicit that uh, got, uh, that Balian is in fact a bastard. We actually know how the bastardry has occurred because there's this whole introduction to the to the Lord of the Village, which is not in the normal movie. Um, Godfrey and the and the local lord interact because they're obviously brothers and there's a whole sort of subplot there and the second thing I wanted to mention because this is sort of on the the ethical and religious side of it is the lord bishop is not present in the theoretical film but he's present in the director's cut and he's actually one of the few sympathetic Christian characters that Scott decides to put in this movie and he's actually quite a wholesome fellow because he actually provides a, a, a small amount of money for Bailey and to bury the wife and he's always echoing this this sentiment that he's going to pray for him and that the wife you know she wasn't possessed by the devil but she was you know um mourning a child and that's perfectly normal uh, whereas but he, go, but he goes street, too far though and he turns into this sort of um simpering soft you know the, um, mo the, the modern christian that the, the gr granted to be Granted, yes, but sir. given how I, I, given how harsh and callous and cynical the other priests in this movie are, yes, but, but this, I, I, this I just I just I just want to say that it is interesting that the two <laughs> things are put side by side. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just interesting that they're put side by side so early in the movie. I hate to um, bring in modern Catholicism here, but Pope mm. Francis often crusades against what he considers to be rigidity. Yeah. And this is one extreme to the other, is that we have a overly liberal um, conception of Christianity, uh, which almost to the point of being theologically unsound. And then we have a overly zealous, dogmatic and insincere iteration of Christianity. And it mm. is these two exactly. contrasting things which are constantly put against each other, which derails any sort of realistic conception yes. of the church or Christianity. And I, again, I, I, I would and say- And the reason why they do that is because that extreme liberal um, view would, would not be, people would not be so sympathetic to it if they were, if it was opposed to, you know, the real religion, the real church, as opposed to this um, scarecrow, this this puppet, which has been created only to be- Caricature. Yeah, the yeah. straw man church. Mm. Yes, and uh, it's unfortunate, but this is the way it is portrayed in the film. And someone in the chat is mentioning, uh, wasn't William Wallace depicted as a minor noble? No, he was also portrayed as a, uh, as a as just an honest man wanting to return back and raise a family until he is compelled to fight the English. Uh, it's not so uh, straightforward with Bailey and Evibelin. He's portrayed as a more complex character. Nevertheless, he is a bastard. And as we emphasize, his bastardy invalidates again his his nobility he can't be a noble and there's also a little hint of historical irony which the film is littered with it i'll get into that later mm. now. and uh for uh, the actual sort of character of balian uh the, the biggest inspiration of course fictional representation is that of david earl of huntington uh, the Prince of Scotland, or wearing his alias of Sir Kenneth, uh, in Walter Scott's Talisman. Uh, many of the interactions that we see from Balian are those experienced by uh, Sir Kenneth in this uh, fictional portrayal. Um, however, the fictional portrayal of Godfrey is based on Barrison of Ibelin. Um, the interesting thing about the House of Ibelin, first of all, if Godfrey is Barrison, Barrison would have died in 1150. 
<laughs> so uh, all the ages are wrong for all these characters. Orlando Bloom is portrayed as a much younger man, mm -hmm. uh, almost to make the, the romance plot seem rather believable, but he was middle-aged when we talk about the inception of this plot and Barrison was long dead. Nevertheless, just to have a quick segue, a segue onto the House of Iblen, the House of Iblen was a noblesse novelle, a new nobility. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, they ri rose from possible Pisan ancestry to become a major political power in Jerusalem from around uh, the beginning of the Second uh, Crusade onwards in the 1140s, uh, when Barrison was awarded the Castle of Ibelin uh, through the marriage gained uh, through various uh, vassals, Ramler, etc. Um, he had uh, various sons, Hugh, Baldwin, and Balian. Um, his brothers would rule from their main seat at Ramler, and uh, Barrison's, uh, again, policy of loyalty to the king um, is what ensured the rapid rise of the House of Iblen, but of course all of this is omitted, and uh, apart from the fact that we have the attitude of Godfrey being loyal to the king, uh, we don't get any of this impression uh, from the film. All of sort of Godfrey's uh, history, even in the theatrical version, um, is implied, and again, the idea of a bastard being accepted as the legitimate successor of Godfrey would have been nonsense in the time either, um, but historically, the uh, the young Bayan would have received Iblin in 1169, uh, 15 years before the ostensible beginning of this film. And I, I don't pay too much attention to 1184. I think it's just a framework uh, to relate this back to yeah. 1187, which is the fall of Jerusalem. But really, it's an arbitrary date, and all of the dates in this uh, this fictional depiction are arbitrary because there is no attempt. Well, again, one of the defences of the film is that this isn't trying to portray a history book. Yes, I can understand that, but there's being true to the historical spirit whilst being a little bit creative with the facts and the issue with this film isn't that it's true to every specific detail is that it deliberately takes those details to subvert the spirit yeah. of the true history it's it's actively hostile isn't there also mm. something about um 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 Balian's father barrison where he married very well and got you know a, a large new holding yes yes he he received ramler uh, from his marriage, uh, which uh, I think more than tripled uh, yeah. the the wealth, the domains of the territory. And, and, this and is that funny became thing, the siege of the Elder Brothers, yeah. Yeah, because you have this line, you know, where Balian's sort of just shocked that he's in front of the king. But, you know, the real Balian was, you know, probably one of the most powerful noblemen in... And experienced. Military yeah, and very well experienced. Advisors. Yeah. Yes, uh, th essentially he was almost like the third most powerful uh, man in the realm uh, behind Raymond of Tripoli. In, in terms of that faction, uh, there was Raymond of Tripoli and there was Balian, one of the great supporters, and then of course there was the opposing faction, but we'll get into that. And this is where we, again, begin to meet another great caricature. We've already talked about the the murder of, uh, well, Michael Sheen, of course, is murdered by um, Orlando Bloom, and this precipitates the, again, Orlando Bloom's very confused uh, pursuit of redemption in Jerusalem. I don't believe it's ever sort of sincere, and it's really the uh, revelation that he is uh, Godfrey of Ibelin's son, which spurs him on to join his father. Uh, of course, um, he has broken the law. He is a murderer. Godfrey tries to defend his son from the local law, uh, interestingly enough, led by Jamie Lannister. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, most of his party are shot, and the Lord of Ibelaine is mortally wounded. But not before they get to Messina, where they meet Guy de Lusignan. Just, just, um, just before we get to Guy, to Guy, is there not also, if I recall, you have this sort of, um, it's quite a diverse traveling party. They have, you know, the big um, braid-haired, blonde German, and then they also have some... Um, um, some 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 black guy. <laughs> I don't know where exactly he's meant to oh, be. I, I don't. I don't. Of all the things you can get at this film, that that really is something I don't, I don't have a problem with. I think well, the whole. No, but I'm just motion. curious. I'm just curious. Why was he meant to be there? Because I don't remember there ever being a. a because it's a, I think it's a crusading party, a European and of course domestic crusading party, who are returning. So it's the fact that they represent this uh, diverse element in the sense that the Kingdom of Jerusalem is a, uh, a melting pot of all of these various cultures. Mm -hmm. And there would have been Germans. Uh, of course, the Saracens, the Saracen, of course, was a name which was applied to all Muslims and Frank or Latin was a name which was yeah. applied to all members of the Outremer, even though, again, they came mm -hmm. from Spain, they came from uh, England, they came from France, they came from Germany, they came from Italy. And as we mentioned, the origins of the House of Ibelin are possibly Italian. Mm. I should say, though, I should say it's not it's not um, that, I, that I'm trying to say that this would be historically impossible. Um, you know, I don't understand the context, but I wouldn't say that. I mean, of course, um, perfectly plausible. But it's more it's more the fact that... Um, 
it Let's feels wedged say, I can, in. I can, I, should we I, say? Yeah, I can, I can understand the reasons why Hollywood directors would enjoy that, find it mm. convenient. Well, what, what's interesting is because someone just said in the comments about him being an Ethiopian, that's the point, is that, say, during the Crusader periods, be it the be it the Byzantine army, be it the armies of the, um, you know, the Crusader states, uh, the Counts of Tripoli or uh, Principal of Antioch, whatever, Kingdom of Jerusalem, is that there were a living of Christian Arab allies to an extent in each of those realms, right? Or, or, or at least hide mercenaries in, in some instances in some of those realms. So it's not implausible. But what's sort of interesting is that it's a, a, a man of, shall I say, sub-Saharan extraction, but portrayed as a Saracen. He actually speaks Arabic, even though he's not an Arab. That's like the strange thing, like a sort of like ultra melting pot <laughs> angle, if you get my, get my meaning. Just like well, to, I mean, to was, add more exotic was, to it, you know. I mean, there was Morgan Freeman in Robin Hood, the Den oh, of Thieves, well, of course. which is which is much earlier than this film. So, indeed, so again, indeed. I don't, I don't yes. really have an issue. I don't have an issue. With it. I, I mean, I, I, it I'm not saying I, I'm not saying I have an issue, but it's just like a, another element that a lot of people might not pick up on is just more. I'm saying, yeah, and, and you could you, you take it with the whole sort of. Um, um, message of the film you know yeah yeah uh, so, and it's and it's worth saying in the director's cut too that the it, it for some inexplicable reason the actual party is larger you actually see more of the cast as well i, I don't know why they decide to cut back on that necessarily in the, in the theatrical cut but in the director's cut rather than being so like a roving band of half a dozen men it actually looks more like um you know a a, a um a noble and a group of retainers it seems more formal i don't know again that that's just a point that's a film rep uh, a, a mere film point but anyway continue so from here we have the first interaction with uh, guy de lusignan and in many ways he is the combination or allusion to a, a more characters from talisman namely the infamous uh, Jacques Amory, uh, the fictional Grand Master of the Templars, uh, but again, more appropriately, the historical comrade of Montferrat, uh, who was a character roughly contem uh, contemporary with the historical Guy, uh, who was a major character in the Third Crusade, nevertheless the uh, uh, less admirable traits almost superimposed on Guy. And it is here that we see friction within the political situ uh, situation in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, where Guy de Lusignan declares that both Godfrey and Baldwin are are essentially traitors the church traitors to god and this is where we have the whole basis of the film what the film is trying to celebrate and protect and almost in a modern sense wish upon our modern modern political situation very much with the title at the end which is the kingdom of heaven uh, when i because i watched this film a long time ago and i only watched it rewatched it last night and i came up with the idea of uh, the kingdom of heaven as being this uh, rogue theological concept and my my misremembering of the film was the idea that the kingdom of heaven uh, was in a sort of purely Christian sense, a kingdom and not of this earth. Yeah. And therefore there was this supreme theological aspect to it, which almost became sort of nihilistic or fatalism when it came to the affairs of the worldly kingdom of heaven. However, I, I forgot about this specific scene which contradicts that which is the kingdom of heaven as a kingdom of conscience, according to Godfrey, uh, Godfrey is so because of the peace, the toleration, the ecumenism between yeah. Muslims and Christians forged by Baldwin and Salah al-Din. And this, of course, is reinforced when we have Balian hearing the prayers of the Muslims in Messina, and he says it sounds like our prayers from hearing yeah. the Saracens yeah. uh, uh, talk about peace and praying towards uh, uh, praying towards Mecca. So the film's point of view is very obvious. And whilst we have hints of, um, you can say, a liberal Christian theology, which are applied to this, uh, it is the liberal conception of ecumenism or toleration, uh, which is celebrated principally by Godfrey. And it becomes the political program which is defended. And the film tries to, you know, uh, defend mm. uh, the, the policy of Baldwin IV. Um, and this is something which Ridley Scott uh, purposefully declared that he uh, played up. Um, in order to create a message from the film, but also make it re supposedly relatable uh, to contemporary audiences when he knows full well and admitted uh, that this piece, as it was demonstrated in the film, never existed. I would also, and it's worth... uh, I would also just sorry, pause go, it. Go oh, sorry. I was, I was just going to say, because um, as you say, Ridley Scott was English, and I don't know how much um, how much impact he had on the script, but w with the whole idea of um, um, the kingdom of heaven being this very this very worldly concept of something that we can create here, this kingdom of conscience. You do get that sort of um, Anglo Anglican strain of, um, you know, we'll, we'll build the Jerusalem sort of coming through, or at least, at least my mind does. 
Yes, I think that's yeah. a valid conception. I, I, again, I, I was giving the film too much credit when I was misremembering it, yeah, yeah. thinking it was about a, a Christian fatalism. No, it is about building a distinctly alternative ecumenical form of a kingdom of heaven on this earth, which is founded mm. on the idea of religious toleration. Um, and of mm. course, uh, contrast that with Helle Bollock's uh, statement that you only tolerate what is tolerable. Um, yeah, and indeed. <laughs> Indeed, and, and and another thing too, because you mentioned about um the the Lord's son being a was a Lannister, and uh, yes, it's it's the man who says in the in the movie that um the the prayers are like ours, or the conversation that he's having with Bailey is it happens to be also Lucius Verena's from Rome. It's just like really, you know, you you really sort of <laughs> you're destroying they, these these guys. They one have by these one. stock <laughs> characters. They need to roll out. They do good work. <laughs> Yes. Now I want to uh, talk about the knighting scene uh, because there are there are elements to which this is historical and anti-historical. Mm. Um, of course, one can refer back to the the Pentecostal oath, uh, the famous uh, account of Sir Thomas Mallory in Le Modetta, or the Death of Arthur, uh, where according to Mallory, uh, the knights um, uh, had to essentially were charged. Uh, never to be outrageous, nor to commit murder, always to flee treason, by no means be cruel, to give mercy unto him who asketh mercy, upon pain of forfeiture of their worship and lordship of King Arthur forevermore, and always do ladies, damsels, and gentlewomen succour upon pain of death, and also that man take no battles in a wrongful quarrel for no law, um, or for no world's goods. And that is, to some extent, the basis of the Knights Oath, with the extension that there is often a specific um, idea of the defense of the church, and the preservation of the church, especially wedded to this idea of the mass monastic orders. And this is uh, substantiated with aspects of the um, the ritualized idea of the, uh, the knighthood ceremony in terms of the preparation, uh, the night vigil, uh, the ritual bathing, the cleansing, the symbol before purification, uh, the white clothing, uh, which is, of course, one worn by uh, Godfrey as he uh, knights. Uh, his bastard son, uh, little elements such as uh, wearing the, the black shoes, which symbolize death. And then, of course, we have the famous, the blow or the collet, uh, which is, first of all, in terms of the early conception of the oath, uh, it was utilized by a slap, a hit, a box on the ear. And later we see it in its modern form, substituted with the tap on the neck uh, with a sword. And the point of the blow in particular is it is supposed to be the last blow that a knight will receive that is not essentially avenged, that he will, uh, <laughs> but, but by that I mean it is the last sort of strike he will receive that uh, uh, he will not count, that he, he will countenance. Uh, that, that is the point of the collet, but in the film it is recontextualizes so you remember the oath which is interesting enough robbed of many of its chivalric elements. You have the defense of the helpless which is a key element which is emphasized again by the hospitaller, hospitaller rather, but the notions of chivalry towards women and the specific defenses of the church are all, this is what I mean by the film is subversive. It takes these elements and removes certain elements which can be in contradiction with the idea that a perfect knight has to in some way be a vassal of the church. And this is something which of course, the uh, Bailey and Abibla in the film never swears on, and uh, again, adopting this uh, radical sort of uh, uh, anti-church view of Christianity or knighthood. That's a, that's a very interesting point. It almost treats, uh, just to use an example from the opposite end of the Eurasian continent, it actually almost treats these knights as if they were Ronan in that way. Yes, rogue knights uh, without a lord. Um, exactly, precisely. Yeah. Um, and that is why it is uh, so subversive and, uh, again, contrasted with this. And uh, one of the most egregious, uh, again, moving on to um, a kingdom, uh, essentially the God wills it, the day is full to me, <laughs> versus and, a kingdom and, and of just for, And I suppose anyone who doesn't know, a ronin is essentially a Japanese samurai without a daimo, without a lord. Just, yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, uh, upon entry into Messina, uh, we hear a fanatic spouting out, to kill an infidel is the path to heaven. And you can ignore that as the rantings of some deluded madman, were it not for the later scene where we have the Templars being hanged in the Marshal of Jerusalem's courtyard, uh, where 
he Balian essentially essentially sort of uh, asks the Hospitaller, uh, they are being killed for what the Pope would command them to do. So yeah. this is enunciated, enunciated as policy later on in the film. So this isn't something which um, I'm taking out of context and blowing out of all proportion. No, this is established in the film as the basis for the Crusades. And this is unequivocally not what the Crusades were for. The idea of indiscriminate murder yeah, of various going, Muslims. Going, going murder to Muslims. No, yeah. when we have the uh, the sermon at Clermont, uh, the idea is about penitential warfare. The purpose of the Crusades was the preservation of the idea of Christendom and its holy sites, and therefore securing the roots of pilgrimage, which is a fundamental aspect, especially in the medieval period, of Christian worship, not murder unleashed on Muslims for its own sake. To this end, every crusader dedicated his life to suffering on behalf of this end for the glory of God and service to other Christians, whether it be to protect their lives or their ability to worship. Well, I mean, even, is... um, even to some extent, the clues in the name, because, I mean, you know, crusade, croissade, you take the cross, that was what you yes. said. You know, there's the idea of a burden inherent in the name. Yes, again, to imitate Christ, to return yeah. to Jerusalem, to carry the cross is explicit. And, of course, the film... Uh, knows this and uh, <laughs> takes the most uh, unequivocally sort of poor reading of the Crusades to justify the latest sort of uh, sentiments and fanaticism which the Hospitaller, uh, Hospitaller talks about. And of course, well, um, um, any, any chance to take a dig at the Pope, I suppose. Yes, and, and this is substantiated, if people want to know, by the uh, Historia Holusum uh, Bitana, uh, and which, again, Urban calls for the race of the Franks to defend Christian orthodoxy, reform the church, and um, ensure that Christians come to the aid of Greek Christians in the East. So not only is this um, uh, defense of Catholicism, but there's also, in terms of the actual sort of motivations for the First Crusade, the defense of orthodoxy as well, the Eastern Christians, whether they be the Copts, whether they be the Orthodox. Of course, this is uh, ambiguous in terms of the, the level at which this was enforced. And of course, Catholics were always given a privileged position in the Outram Estates. And there was um, into sort of religious dialogue, but all of this is omitted in the film. None of all the Christians are essentially presented as one, a more, a one sort of block. You have the radical Christians of the liberal sort of theolog theological sect, which essentially act as mouthpieces for the screen uh, for the screenwriter, and then you have the fanatical Christians. But actual sort of uh, uh, denominational sort of uh, distinctions within the film are completely omitted. And as Marcus, you're aware, the idea of any sort of Byzantine connection is again completely omitted yeah. from this film. Yes, I it's, mean, it's, it's, it's utterly not existent. Yes, there's just that. Um... <laughs> <laughs> that almost again very sort of American or or these days British just ignorance of um of denominations and our our, our yeah. bafflement um yeah. Greeks in Anatolia surely not I can't possibly conceive <laughs> of the idea and, and also and, and I'm under I have to just laugh because it's a bit of an obviously joke in our circles I'm under strict instructions that I I can undertake no great Byzantine tangents but um what is interesting is that even at this point in time because this is obviously prior to the Fourth Crusade prior to the events of 1203 1204 Constantinople is still probably it can be said confidently the greatest city in Christendom and there is not a single mention of it through the entire film. I mean, the, the Crusades are after all waged in sort of a, a, a Western Latin alliance with the East to sort of... Um, to some guarded, extent, to, but, that makes, but that makes it more interesting. The yeah, friction makes it more interesting. Yeah. I mean, things like the massacre... You know? Yes, things like the massacre of the Latins, which occur during this time, are completely non-existent. The fact Correct, that yeah. uh, Salah al-Din uh, favoured the ecumenical patriarch um, aligned with the ecumenical patriarch in Constantinople is completely mm. omitted. Absolutely. Uh, but again, uh, just to to, uh, to quickly mention, though, uh, we have the, the shipwrecking of Bayan and Ibelin, and um, he arrives and he, uh, he discovers... His uh, plot armour shows. <laughs> yes, Alexander Siddick. Uh, who I love, he's uh, uh, Dr. Julian Bashir from uh, Deep Space Nine, uh, who apparently is uh, portraying Imad Adin al Isfahani, uh, a Persian scholar who was also a friend of Salah al Din. And this is a, another reference to the talisman, uh, where he is clearly an allusion to the fact that Saladin met and fought uh, Sir Kenneth incognito. But of course, there is a subversion in the fact that he doesn't actually fight, he is simply captured and then released as a slave. Um, or again, after offering, and again, I also feel there's a possible allusion to Morgan Freeman as a zeme because basically the backstory is almost completely the same. Um, there's a but strong hint of it there, isn't it, of a zeme in in, uh, in that character? 
Yes, and this is, of course, a moment for Bailey and Biblin to acquire some form of glory and establish a form of notoriety. And again, which is, as we'll get into uh, the implications of his bastardy, is completely unearned and uh, anachronistic to the period. But when Bailey arrives, uh, one of his first things again is to go to Calgary, uh, Calgary uh, to go to the uh, hill of Golgotha, uh, where he buries his wife Necklace and will later admit to the uh, Hospitaller uh, that he heard nothing he felt nothing he has lost his religion such as it ever was there in the, to begin with yeah. um and uh, this disillusioned um graceless Balin of Ibelin, who is nevertheless the personification in the film's mindset of the perfect knight, is the consistent running issue that we see with the character of Balin of Ibelin, because he never actually has to struggle religiously, because he he abandons the fight right to begin, right at the beginning. Yeah, because this hospitaler just turns up and tells him that none of it matters. He tells him, you know, I've seen enough religion, you know, all that matters is in your head, and your heart. Um, you know, he's, exactly, kind of, exactly. he's the kind of person who you can imagine... Um, basically, you know, basically, I, I, the hospitaler is John Lennon. We let's just establish that. Yeah, I mean, it's worse. It's, yeah, it's the idea of you know, um, oh well, you know, God's probably real, but he's just this big sort of. Do you want to hear the exact man, quote? You know, <laughs> it's insufferable. The, ex the exact quote is: "I put no stock in religion. By the word of religion, I've seen the lunacy of fanatics of every denomination call the will of God." And of course, in basic movie language oh look he calls every fanatics of every denomination call the will of god what do the fanatics do they say god wills it isn't that clever we set it up earlier off when the <laughs> hospitaler he told us this was going to happen uh, no this is a cheap movie trick to elicit your uh, again uh, a perverted view of the crusades holiness is in right action and courage on behalf of the defenseless goodness isn't here for you to decide or not and again this is a very sort of proto-protestants uh solar uh, fide conception of christianity yeah. where one can receive salvation outside of the church for a hospitaler of all people to say this is again completely anachronistic and this character almost seems completely yeah, again inserted to voice uh either ridley scott or william moynihan on a notion of the of the director really it is the director who and the you know he was also the producer um ridley scott uh, who bears final responsibility and he can alter and request changes in the screenplay william moynihan was essentially doing a service for ridley scott so ultimately i believe ridley mm -hmm. scott you know deserves the blame for this but there on is the base, some... oh Sorry, just go ahead, just quickly if i may say on the basis of this um uh because I was sort of saying before about how, the, how there's no reference to references to Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire, which is sort of, in some ways, you can't actually have the Crusades without the existence of the East Roman Empire to its north, right? Uh, but but that is an aside. Rag plays actually makes a comment which it actually has jogged my memory. Uh, it's not it's not a super chat, but it's, it's pertinent to the conversation. Rag plays says the movie plays on the audience's knowledge of history, which is nothing, and expects yes. them to take for granted that these lands had always belonged to Islam. And what's interesting yes. there is. For anyone who is probably older than 30, and if you played the first Assassin's Creed um, video game on whatever console or computer you had, if you, uh, as um, Altair, you go around the major cities on the coast that weren't held by the Crusaders and you actually are, are, are meandering amongst the Muslim populations, you often hear the imams preaching. I just remember this because I remember just being irate when I first heard it. The preachers all, well, say like this line, the NPC preachers always say, in Jerusalem, was ours it was always been ours and it's like this lie yes. that they keep repeating in assassin's creed and i always and it always makes me and think it's a, and it's a lie the, the, the it's framing a lie it, it, it is a lie and it's a, the complete framing of how kingdom of heaven is portrayed from start to finish it is that yes. exact frame i and mean i suppose it, 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 it's interesting sorry, you bring up, um, i i was just i was just gonna get in quickly it's interesting that you bring up assassin's creed because another similarity it shares with this film is that they both villainize the templars in a big way don't they yeah uh, can I just get Actually, into yes, this? Good point. Because there's a direct line here, which is Baldwin the king preserves the peace which the Muslims maintained before we came here. Okay, wait. Just to completely debunk this and give a brief history to the run-up to the Crusades to really hammer home the points both of you have brought up. Ooh, Christendom. Yes. Uh, of course, all of these territories were part of the Eastern Empire until the 7th century. After the main series of conquests, which really cooled down after the uh, Umayyads conquered Spain in the 8th century, we see a period of intermittent warfare from 750 until, seven, uh, until 1071. Uh, the main, of course, conquest by the Muslims during that time, as you know, Marcus, was that of Sicily. Um, now, while the mm. situation in Spain 
uh, had been improving for several centuries after the uh, retreat to the Kingdom of Asturias. Uh, the Eastern situation in the Eastern Roman Empire was completely dire after the disastrous Battle of Manzikert, where the Byzantines were defeated and the Muslim Turks overran much of the Anatolian, uh, uh, Anatolian Peninsula uh, from 1071 until 1096. Uh, but also, this isn't just the one impetus for the Crusades either, which is the uh, loss of so many territories to the Muslims, uh, but there was also the increasing persecution and instability within the Muslim-controlled areas in the Levant and the idea of protecting uh, the rights of Christians in those holy sites. In particular, we have Al-Hakim, uh, one of the most infamous uh, Fatimid caliphs who is sometimes known as the, uh, the Islamic version of Nero, who uh, begins at the uh, outset of the sort of uh, the, uh, the 11th onset rather of the 11th century uh, to talk about uh, decrees against the Christians such as the fact they can no longer celebrate Epiphany or Easter in the Levant, they can no longer drink wine and therefore they can no longer practice uh, communion in both kinds. Uh, we have various uh, laws of differentiation uh, which again in introduce sumptuary laws uh, for both Christians and Jews, it should also be pointed out, um, and generals of segregation of Christians and persecution of Christians and Jews. Uh, but before then, we also have various Christian rebellions um, against uh, Al-Hakim's uh, reign, uh, which precipitate the massacre of the Christian populations in Taromina, in Rometa, and in Tyre, uh, which in many ways, uh, when we see the later Christian perpetrated massacres at Antioch and Jerusalem, were very much inspired by essentially an act of vengeance or reprisals based on that. That's not to excuse the act of the Crusaders there, but that is very much the um, impression that the Crusaders had, uh, Godfrey Brillon, etc., and his subordinates. It's the uh, context, and it matters. Yes, it is, it is the context which establishes the First Crusade. And throughout the 11th century, after the um, uh, declining situation of Christians in the Levant under Islam, which again was erroneously declared in the film to be the peace that the Muslims maintained before we came here, uh, is that there were, again, periodic attacks on Christian pilgrims, Christian sites, and therefore when we have Urban II, uh, recalling uh, calling the idea of the crusade, it's in the context of religious reform within Christendom post the Gregorian reform, within the political context of the Pope trying to establish some sort of supremacy over Christendom vis-a-vis -vis the emperor during the investiture controversy. But that's really here, um, neither here nor there. Because in terms of the crusades as this pantechial act of the preservation of Christendom, the crusaders have had more than ample justification. And they've had 400 years of loss and provocation to justify this. So in terms of justifying the Crusades, it's not an issue for me. I can completely understand Urban II's argument. It's not because I'm a Christian. It is simply historical. It doesn't matter whether the roles were reversed. If the Muslims were losing territories, they would feel equally in their rights, as is portrayed in the film, to retake those territories. It is simply a matter that if you keep probing and attacking one sort of ideological or sort of, uh, again, block, I'm just using incredibly sort of modern language to refer to the idea of the Res Republica Christianity, then it's going to eventually result in some sort response and this response was the first crusade and this comes into the appalling treatment of the templars in the in the films uh, but I, just I, also, I also to point um... out that there is a perfect storm element which uh, coincides with the crusades not only do you have the deteriorating uh, situation for christians uh, the retreat of the borders of the eastern roman empire but with the arrival of the seleucs you also have massive infighting and political instability within the Muslim world. The Seleucs are attacking the Fatimids, the Fatimids are giving up more power to their grand viziers. Essentially, the Muslim world is simultaneously expanding, but it is also collapsing. Yeah. And it is into this vacuum that we see the rapid rise of the First Crusades and the reconquest of so much territory. It is the perfect storm which creates these conditions, all of which is oversimplified and omitted in the historical analysis given by the hospital at Tabalian of Ibelin. Yeah. And again, I mean, you know, like I said, you have a clue in the name of the Crusades. You have a clue in the name of many of these knightly orders. I mean, you know, our egregious friend who he's a member of the Knights Hospitaller. I mean, that that name literally comes from the fact that their their original duty, their reason for being was to mm -hmm. protect pilgrims on the way um, to protect hospitals established for pilgrims in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, I mean, you know, that that idea of protection is is written right into what they're doing um and, and i suppose i suppose again um um one can see how from a sort of um a modern perspective influenced by say 
um, neoconservatism. Um, you could be you could be cynical of that view. You know, I, I suppose people like Ridley Scott might think of that as the medieval equivalent of oh we're going to bring freedom and democracy and protect the people and protect the the persecuted but of course um i would say that the the medieval sentiment was far more authentic in many cases um it's worth mentioning too just because you did mention the hospital in jerusalem and that hospital was actually established well before the first crusade was even yeah. conceived of never never mind took place it was actually the, the uh, into, into, in some regard it was actually the place of destination for the pilgrims going to jerusalem because often they'd arrive, uh, you know, disheveled and hungry, and they would actually go to the yes. hospital there as a means yeah. of recuperation on, upon arrival. It actually well, served yeah, a very you, peaceful you, purpose prior to. Well, yeah, would you I mean, both indulge me? And uh, I'd love to talk about the history. This is sort of possibly into the segment which I have here. But um, uh, of course, the interpretation we have from the film. Uh, the Templars are being executed for the killing of Arabs, substantiating what the crazed lunatic said in Messina as the actual goal of the Templars. And of course, uh, both the Hospitaller and Balian talk about um, the king is executing the Templars for what the Pope would command them to do, but not Christ nor this king. Again, complete nonsense. Um, and this brings us on to what the Templars and the Hospitallers were. So we have the spirit of the 11th century Gregorian reforms, and we see major monastic innovations throughout Christendom. And this really needs to be understood, is that these military orders were growing out of the monastic revival in the 11th and the 12th centuries. Um, at the same time that we have the calling of the First Crusade by Urban II, uh, we see the creation of the Order of Cistercians, uh, which is, of course, one of the the founding sort of the uh, uh, main sort of players, and this is of course Bernard of Clairvaux, and mm. it's through Bernard of Clairvaux that we have the direct association between the Order of Cistercians and the rise of the Templars. The Templars did not, of course, participate in the First Crusade. Rather, the Order arose out of necessity to protect pilgrims making their way to the Holy Land, establishing a headquarters in Jerusalem in the Al Aqsa Mosque from 1120 which was the supposed site of the ruins of the Temple of Solomon, giving us the etymology of Templar from Temple, yeah. the ruins of the Temple of Solomon. And by 1129, the order had received official church recognition with the support of uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux and was essentially set up as a European Christian charity, uh, receiving ample resources from the Pope and many European backers, nobles, clergymen, etc. I mean, this um, is, of course, um, um, where I mean, because their villainization started in the Middle Ages, didn't it? Because yes. they made enemies, um, you know, they became something of a bank and a financial power and they were accused of them. Um, Yes, you know, the villainization, Baphomet and all of that. The villainization is within the medieval period. Is I mean, De Nogere and Philip the Fourth were responsible mm, for the mm. excessive villainization in order to justify taking their assets and destroying the order and accusing them of paganism. Uh, but I mean, so obviously that's the the history of the negative attitude. But in terms of the actual sort of history, um, Innocent the Second uh, confirms the Templars as an extraterritorial unit. Um, and they are bound by their allegiance to the Pope. So that aspect of the film's portrayal is true, but not in terms of what the Pope would command them to do. And a interesting quirk of the Templars is that on the one hand, they fulfill this militaristic role in protecting the uh, Christian pilgrimage routes. Um, they also serve as various vanguard units for the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the other Altamir principalities. So I have images of them on the map, the County of Edessa, the County of Tripoli, and the Principality of Antioch, in addition to the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Um, at their height, they have around 20,000 knights, um, but the vast majority of Templars were, of course, non-combatants who had taken monastic vows, uh, who were sworn to lives of poverty. And a byproduct of the extraterritorial nature, the European nature, the Christian nature of the Templars, uh, was that they developed a multinational banking system where they accepted deposits and they even gave credit in order to facilitate the Crusades. So they had a fascinating role, and again, which precipitated their ultimate downfall, which you've alluded to, Columba, at the hands of de Nogere and Philip IV because they became so powerful and because they became a opponent to the political authority of the King of France in the 14th century. However, in the film, they are uh, portrayed essentially as a papal anti-Muslim Einsatzgruppen. Yeah, pretty and much. And the film's antagonists, uh, Guy de Lusignan and uh, Reynaud de Chatillon, are both wearing Templar robes erroneously, as if to damn the order's reputation by association. Yeah, I mean, neither of those men were actually associated with the Templars. No. Uh, that, that's just whole cloth. And again, I would also say, just to keep harping on this theme, 
clues in the name. I, I mean, I mean, all of this. I'm, um, you know, of course, you have the reference to the temple, but then also, I suppose, ironically, um, um, their official title was um, pauperes, right? Which was sort of you know, poor men um, or poor fellow soldiers, which I think is quite funny as well when you consider their. Um, um, the amount of money that they were eventually dealing with. But. Yes, I, th I think that's a fair reference to the first 10 years of the, <laughs> yeah, of the Templar yeah. Order, but definitely not... Not um, paupers after that, no. Not paupers after But I, I think, again, you know, the betrayal of the Hospitallers is positive in the way that the film construes positive, but yes. equally, equally is anachronistic. Um, because, uh, as you mentioned, the Hospitallers were a slightly older order, uh, with specific links to the Benedictine monastic order. The Benedictines, of course, were much older than the Cistercians, with uh, roots going back to, I think, either the 6th or the 7th century. And uh, one of their members, uh, Gerard de Martic, uh, found, founded the infirmary near the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which became the hospital, uh, after which the hospitalers were named. But of course, the idea of caring members of that monastic order, the Benedictine monks caring for pilgrims, had been established way before then, as you've um, already indicated. Yeah. The hospitalers simply took on a more formalized role of what members of the monastic order were already doing. And like the Templars, they evolved into a military order to protect uh, pilgrims. So in many ways, the Hospitallers and the Templars mirrored each other. They were not, uh, they were at, at times antagonistic, uh, but in terms of their fundamental mission, uh, they were again, supposedly acting in harmony, which is mm. again, completely contrasted by the, the good Hospitaller and the evil Templars. Yes, I suppose. I mean, I, we should also know. I mean, I mean, hospital in this in this in in this um, context means more than the modern hospital. You mean to think of it in, with connotations of you know the word hospitality. It's more of a sort of a, a, a wayhouse, I suppose, for for pilgrims. It's not just or, um, for treating or, the or, Ill. or possibly if if one was to look at say the original eighteenth or nineteenth century uh, usage of social justice in the sort of traditional Catholic sense. Um, where, you know, it's arms, it's food, it's a bed, it's basic sanitation and medical sort of, you know, it's not just a hospital, as you say, it's a multifaceted sort of place of respite. And for those who are dying, you might say a place of convalescence as well. Uh, sorry, not oh, convalescence, yeah. what's what I'm looking for? Um, uh, you know, what we'd call sort of palliative care, but, you know, in an older context. Um, it, it served all those purposes and tended to mind and to body and to spirit. It was very much a, a place that did all of that in um, under the guise of an order, and that's what the hospitalers, that's what, what they originally did do in Jerusalem and then elsewhere. Absolutely, and uh, absolutely confirm all your remarks in terms of talking about the, the multifaceted nature. But even though the hospitaler in the film sense is portrayed positively, all of this, again, is omitted because it would complicate the uh, the binary conception of Christianity yeah. um, and lacks any sort of nuance. Um, so it's from here uh, that we also need to talk about um, Balian being received by the retainers of Godfrey. Uh, one of the sort of funny aspects when I watch oh, yeah. this film <laughs> is uh, seeing him, you know, we see the retainers of Godfrey, we see him seeing that we, we see one of the retainers see the sword, and uh, he assumes, you know, you must have known him, oh, you must be his son, when of course my assumption would be if i were that man uh you've killed my master and you've stolen his sword no 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 no, no. i'm pretty sure they do make that assumption yeah i'm with columba on that because uh, uh, he, oh, he, he does, I, yes, he does yes, the eye test yes i know but he wouldn't know what his eyes look like if he killed him there's nothing to preclude that, that that's well, why yeah. i find it so ridiculous while how, how would knowing his height and knowing his eye color preclude him from killing oh him. yeah oh yeah that's the best part yeah he says what color were his eyes yeah because there's only one man in all of europe with blue yes. eyes <laughs> i know it's the, there's nothing there's Very nothing funny. that preclude the i know it's ridiculous that the insinuation mm. that the film thinks it's been clever that this will deduce that he's actually the son no there's nothing clever it's, about it at all <laughs> yeah. it, it, you and might I'll, say it's I'll quite it, say, it, it's, um... it's very it's very smooth brain in attempting to portray cynicism in those characters which it does and it totally fails yeah yeah i tell you what though in, in terms of casting as well you know on a sort of film level i mean it's pretty poor casting liam neeson and orlando bloom i don't buy them as father and son whatsoever i i, I have to admit i love the fact that almaric which is that knight who questioned alien when he arrives in Jerusalem, is played by like, this giant bald serbian man you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know like yes because the serbian's going to be in jerusalem you know in, in the midst of the third crusade um, yeah. anyway and here we, I digress. Yes, here we get to one of the most 
again, weird characters in the film, which is the fictionalized representation of Princess Sibylla. Mm. Now, obviously, there are another allusion to the talisman when we talk about Edith Plantagenet, um, who, again, is Sir Kenneth's love interest. But to my mind, Sibylla seems to be a combination of the characters of Maria Comnene and the historic uh, Sibylla. The latter, um, Maria, was Queen of Jerusalem from 11, and uh, originally, I think she was wife to King um, Amalric. And uh, she, from 1177, was the wife of the historical Balian at Iblin, which would indicate the romance between them. Um, and it is through this marriage that Balian acquired Nablus, um, which became the crown jewel of the dynasty, um, ensuring that the House of Iblin would become one of the most powerful in Jerusalem, that and having the royal link as well. So this marriage is crucial to understanding why Balian of Ibelin would be so highly valued and such a principal advisor within the kingdom. Uh, but of course, inexplicably, Sibylla, knowing absolutely nothing about this man, uh, accepts him and then it ushers in a romance with him. And in order to establish this increasingly bizarre series of events, the historic Sibylla has to be eliminated entirely because nothing in the historical Sibylla indicates any romance between uh, her and the historic Balian of Ibelin. Note also that the historic Balian of Ibelin is twice as old historically as he's yeah. portrayed in this fictionalized, I mean, it's, past, it, it, it's bastardized quite, it's version. Quite, um, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? At times they were sort of um, um, a sort of opposed to each other, were they not? Yes, Maria Comnene and Sibylla were rivals. So you're taking two characters who were opposites and you're combining them to make an entirely anachronistic new mm. character. And one aspect which I found uh, rather paradoxical is that she is clearly again sort of acting in the spirit of the ecumenical sort of a uh, tolerant peace which her brother Baldwin has ushered in and her relationship with Baldwin is a, a very sort of core component of the film and her character albeit is rather confused mm -hmm. and there is an element of the orient orientalized princess which is true in the sense that Maria Comnene was responsible for introducing many aspects of Byzantine etiquette Byzantine dress and court culture into the fr essentially French court uh, uh, high court culture in Jerusalem, but not Oriental in the sense of it being Islamic, Oriental in the sense of it being Greek and Byzantine. So in that sense, again, it is completely anachronistic. In terms of what although, the actual... um, although um, just to just to counter that slightly, I mean, there is some debate um, because, as I mentioned, you had importation of um, um, you know architectural fashions into Europe to some extent, but also in terms of um, um, you know, if you look at how women are depicted, it's really at this period that you begin to see them wearing the the wimple and the veil. Um, you know, and the sort of, uh, and then later, once you get into the um, the 1300s, you know, the sort of um, um, the, the veil that covers the whole face and the chin, which is sort of um, 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 what's the word? I'm looking for, diaphanous or or see through. Um, and, and a lot of people do think that this fashion was sort of imported or copied from um, from. No, I, I, I completely women. grant you. I completely grant your point. I think what I'm you're, you're alluding to, Columba, is subtle permutations of culture, as yes. opposed to a woman coming out and looking indistinguishable from what you would assume would be, for example, Salah al Din's uh, again daughter or princess or wife. Yeah, she, or she's acting like she's acting like a sort of um, a, you know, a young a young white woman on her gap here in India yes. who's yes. getting her henna tattooed. Um, no, a absolutely. Yeah. To me, she's almost your stereotypical um, gap year student having some sort of uh, cultural crisis and yes. uh, begins to experience and sample <laughs> new cultures. And it is, again, a crutch, a trope. Uh, and Sibylla is, uh, exemplifies that trope. In reality, of course, she was happily married to Guy de Lusignan, and the marriage had produced several children. And she, of course, had been, sorry, uh, to, no, no children with Guy de Lusignan, sorry. She had produced uh, a child by her previous husband, William Longsword, who would later become Baldwin V. Uh, this isn't such a problem in the theatrical version because all of this is included in that and we'll be basing, therefore, our assessment on that interpretation, not all of the theatrical version, where all of this is omitted and overly simplified and all the more absurd. But here we come to another character, the introduction of Raymond of Tripoli, also known as Tiberius, uh, which is actually after one of the uh, areas of holds in fief, Tiberius. And he is uh, portrayed as the marshal of Jerusalem. Uh, he meets him in the context of the execution of the Templars and meeting, of course, uh, Raynaud of Châtillon, uh, who is accused of raiding the Muslim caravans. So Raynaud de Châtillon is 
demonstrated as a bigot, a murderer, and also a coward for not accepting responsibility for his men's lives. So in the worst possible connotation, we have the introduction of Raymond de Chatillon. Well. Um, but Raymond, uh, his introduction is completely anachronistic as well, because Raymond was not an officer of the king as marshal. Um, he was one of the great Outremer lords. If anything, he was the second greatest of all the Outremer lords as the Count of Tripoli. And he had his own political interests and accounts both contemporary to the times and modern portray him as everything from the most able counsellor in all of the Outremer domains to the presider over a litany of disasters, degrading essentially himself and the kingdoms he served to the point of irrelevance with Hatton being the final nail in the coffin. And what the film portrays Raymond as is the faithful executor of Baldwin's legacy rather than the leader of a faction grappling for influence over the kingdom and with himself serving often as the antagonist to the designs yeah, of Baldwin IV. Yeah. Uh, but there's one little point which William of Tyre uh, uses to discuss about um, uh, Raymond de Tripoli, uh, which I thought was strangely applicable to Jeremy Irons' portrayal of the character when he first meets Bailey of Ibelin and says, your father was my friend, I am yours. He was always liberal to strangers, but not affable towards his own men, <laughs> to explain his inexplicable <laughs> fondness towards this complete stranger. And um, again, in terms of substantiating this idea that he is in many ways the executor of upholding Baldwin's legacy and the idea of the kingdom of conscience is founded on tolerance, uh, he is quoted as saying, Baldwin and Saladin together would make for a better world. Yeah. And this is actually alluding to something much darker in Raymond de Tripoli's history, which is that Raymond often employed a personal policy of neutrality, sometimes even alliance with Salah al-Din, so as to pose Guy de, Guy de Lusignan. Um, but often, again, this was for his own purposes, his own political purposes, not out of any conception of high-minded ecumenism, which the film tries to get across. Yeah. So the character again, that I, I, it's, it's a shame. I mean, I think that would be, again, much more interesting. You know, <laughs> you know, you know yes. like, I, I would much more enjoy that. I want to declare that the story is fantastic. The, histor the history behind this period is complicated, it's fantastic, and the simple story of having a kingdom riven by factionalism, having a noble king who is debilitated by a condition, desperately trying to hold all of these factions together, but succumbing to his illness, and seeing the factionalism ultimately doom this kingdom is a brilliant story, but that isn't the story that Ridley Scott chose to tell. Instead, we have this, again, liberal conception of peace in the Middle East, which has been superimposed. And in order to make this story work, uh, Bailey and Evibelin is the worst example, but Raymond de Tripoli suffers from it as well, is that these characters, these historical characters, are nothing more than skin suits for yeah. the writer's intentions. And Raymond de Tripoli is one such character, because, again, the actions and motivations of the historical character are completely at odds with this man who essentially serves the film as a servant. And again, he says it at the end, um, I've served Jerusalem my entire life, when again, his legacy is that much more complex. And we'll get to that particular infamous quote uh, when we get to the Battle of Hatim. Uh, but this is one of, the, I think this is probably the most pregnant and ridiculous, <laughs> one of the most pregnant and ridiculous uh, quotes that we, we see in the film. We have uh, Bailey of Ibelin in the palace in Jerusalem uh, with the court and Guy de Lusignan comes down he mocks the king's absence and declares to Balian, uh, this would not inherit in France, while also yes. referencing, Sibylla does not lament my absence. Now, let me just completely destroy this. The house of Lusignan was from Poitou in France. They're originally the vassals of the Duke, obviously Eleanor of Aquitaine, mm. um, and later Richard the Lionheart. Uh, Richard, who banished Guy for the slaying of the Earl of Salisbury along with his brothers, um, Guy was thus essentially banished from his homeland in France, departed for Jerusalem with his brother Amory, um, and married into the Ibelin family in order to gain uh, influence and prestige and accumulate mm. the title of Constable of Jerusalem. So the disgraced family from France were, were marrying into the House of Ibelin in yeah. order to gain prestige and power. And uh, this is, again, through making an alliance with uh, Agnes of Courtney, the, uh, the Queen Mother, mm. again, a character who does not appear at all in the story. The it's essentially inverted in, thus... the, in the film. It's basically an inversion. Yes. Yes, the Lusignan family were thus the disgraced, uh, were disgraced in France and the ambitious newcomers, while the Ibelin family were the already established power. Mm -hmm. And um, just to emphasize this again and to talk about the anachronism, which is Raymond of Tripoli, um, in reaction to the rise of the, uh, the, the House of Lusignan, Raymond of Tripoli, four years ostensibly before this film begins, attempted a coup 
against the Lusignans and the Queen Mother to force Sibylla to marry uh, Balian's older brother, Baldwin of Ibelin, only to produce the opposite effect as the king sided with the Lusignans and arguably forced Sibylla to marry Guy. So this was a new political struggle brought in by these troublemakers and relative newcomers who were acquiring titles. They were not by any means an established power and is part of the foreignness of Guy de Lusignan and the fact that he was seen as an ambitious latecomer that explains why the native nobility was so hostile to him. And, and all it, continued, of this... um, it continued all the way into the Third Crusade when Richard yes. the Lionheart actually came, didn't he? Yes. Um, and it, it, this, this struggle was still going on. Yes, uh, Richard the Lionheart, the man who originally banished him, actually later during the Third Crusade saw Guy de Lusignan as technically his vassal, and he tried to utilize what, that what, to, to advance um, his claim. They to were the related, throne. weren't they? Uh, I'm not sure the Lusignan family were related. Needless to say, the Lusignan family have a long and varied history in terms of the relationship with both the King of France and the King of England, and they yeah. were later serve as the Kings of Cyprus, all the way up until the annexation of Cyprus by uh, the Venetians in the 15th century. So the Lusignans are a fascinating family with their own history, and this is their most sort of a notorious aspect on the historical world stage. But just to point out that everything that Guy de Lusignan says in that scene is inverted. <laughs> Everything yeah. is wrong, um, but it should be directed the other way around. Just, answer, say, what, just, say, answer, uh, just answer your question, Colombo, very briefly. The Lusignans, with, when they relocate to Cyprus, they actually do marry into the um, sort of remnant of the, uh, you can see on this map here, the, the Principality of Armenian uh, Kalikia, which lies between Byzantine, okay, the Byzantine okay. Empire and the Principality of Antioch. The Lusignans basically marry into the um, the Armenian uh, Cilician uh, royal yes. family as well. Mm. Okay. Yes, they briefly become okay. kings of Armenia as well for a, for a brief amount of time during the oh, really? century. <laughs> that yes. is a storied family. Wow. Yes, they're 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 they're, they're a fascinating, fascinating family. Do do advise everyone to go and check out the real yeah. history of the Danusignon, yeah. not the ridiculous yeah. interpretation. But, but, yeah, the um, the, the, the Danusignon Rubenid dynasty, <laughs> the <laughs> dead branch. <laughs> but uh, one thing That's I will deep, say, deep reference there, Marcus. One thing yes. I will say in defense of this film, um, um, and I might get flagged for it, but I love the um the performance that the the actor gives oh martin Sokas. i think it's so entertaining you sit at my table it. <laughs> it's so good there's just he's just this sort of very foppish villain mm. with the big fur lined I, cloaks you know my wife great. who does not lament my absence <laughs> that either makes her the very best of wives or the very worst Gosh. yeah by the way is it i haven't seen a king would, um, at this table for a long time you know oh it's so good it's so good <laughs> yes love it. uh it's a caricature all of this is a caricature but yeah. again that uh, that's that aspect of sibylla does not lament my absence again a complete they were not estranged they were no. devoted to each other, acted publicly, and from 1180 to 1182, the couple acting in tandem with the most influential power block in Jerusalem and periodically acted as regents. And it's during this time that Raymond of Tripoli, Tiberius, the, the great ally as portrayed in, uh, by, in the film, is banished from the kingdom in favour of the power of Guy yeah. de Lusignan. And this is where we meet um, uh, Baldwin IV, the leper king, uh, brilliantly played by Edward Norton, because there are some positive aspects of the film. People in the chat have already mentioned the, the costumes, which are, again, superb. Mm, yeah. uh, the musicals, I'm a big fan of the musical score mm -hmm, by uh, mm -hmm. uh, Gregson, uh, Gregson Williams. There are some crossovers with uh, uh, Hans Zimmer's uh, 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 Vide Cormeum from Hannibal. All these uh, things I, I like. I mean, I, and, I, would uh, say, I would say that the music is far more sensitive to, to the medieval spirit, because I yes. remember there's, there, there's this song which plays um, it plays in the beginning at the end, you know, when he's looking out in his garden and he sees first his wife and then he sees Sibylla. And the song is almost, you know, when I heard it for the first time rewatching it, it immediately put me in the mind of the Troubadour songs. Mm. And so you get this idea of that, the lightness and the jauntiness of the Middle Ages, yeah. which did exist then, coming through through the music, but not through uh, much else of the film. So I think, um, yes, the music is, uh, there's much to applaud there. It's far more sensitive. Mm. It elevates the film, and again, this this film doesn't deserve that musical score. It doesn't deserve its production values. It doesn't deserve some of his actors, which is again mm -hmm. why it's so depressing. Because the film simultaneously immerses you in this medieval setting, but also it subverts it in such a way as to destroy it. Which yes, is it why... immerses you into a false reality. Yes, which is why this I believe this film is so again disastrous, and why actually the the, th the things which technically elevate the film almost do us 
uh, receiving this uh, <laughs> this uncritically a disservice. Yes, it just uh, makes so, the trap more inviting. <laughs> yes. Um, and just a, a note on Baldwin the Fourth. Of course, he talks about his um, his curse, the leprosy. The Saracens say that disease is a punishment from God for the vanity of my kingdom, and that the chastisement that awaits me in hell is far more severe. If that is true, I call it unfair. Um, I, I remember hearing a long time ago. I can't really draw a testament to this, but I think it was when I used to watch um, real crusades history. I don't. It, Touch would actually watch really any sort of a YouTubers, a historical YouTubers. No. Um, but nevertheless, uh, they were doing an interview. I forget which uh, scholar it was, but uh, it was more that this was inverted. Rather, the leprosy was seen as an act of holiness, a, a sign of holiness, a sign of sort of uh, divine favor. Yes, I, know, I um, that the king I, I... was suffering in the in the manner of Christ, and this uh, elevated his prestige and his mystique in Europe, rather than again calling it some sort of a God-given sort of punishment well, I, on the, on I, I the would say, um, vanity of the I... kingdom. I would say that there were there were there were two views. That was one view, and then the other view was the the traditional idea that um, leprosy was a punishment. I believe it was Pope. Um, it might be Pope Innocent the Third. I'm not sure. That might be wrong, but um, he he believed that um, leprosy was a punishment, and there is mm. there is some sort of precedent for it in some of the writings of um of um the fathers. I believe um, um Gregory the Great also had had um had this view, but it's interesting that you that you mention that because certainly. Um, around Baldwin, there was this support, and, and I believe actually um, it was something that many of the Muslims were quite shocked by. And there are some Muslim sources which say, you know, uh, um, the, you know, the Franks incredibly ignore their um, their king's illness, which is clearly yes. a, a scourge from God, and and, and all of this. So, um, um, yeah, that, that that is there. So there is complexity to the view which we're enunciating. And I, I think I agree with you, Columba, that it's a plurality of views which inform mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I, I, I think it's fair to say that this element of the, the suffering king, Allah Christ, who sort of, again, wearing the crown of thorns, it's something that very much, again, appeared to contemporaries of the period and allow people to tolerate the rule of a leper king when, again, he was debilitated by this condition. And nevertheless, he was a competent and effective king. Mm. Um, he references uh, his victory. At the age of 16, the the bottle of a uh, battle of a uh, uh, Montesard in uh, 1177. Uh, the irony, of course, being that he talks to Balian about this when Balian, the real Balian, fought in that battle <laughs> for Baldwin, <laughs> along with uh, Reynaud de Chatillon. Uh, One of the uh, many plot holes in this entire story. Yes, and uh, I, I, I did um I, I did I did do a little bit of reading about the leprosy though, and it's interesting because there is a thing um um that was tossed around by some theologians, and I believe it um. It, um, it came up in some um, 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 Jewish sources, um, even before Christ, that there was this idea of um, um, leprosy as the disease, but also leprosy as um, um, divine punishment. And in some sense, um, the two phenomena, although they might um, display themselves similarly, there's there's a different cause. One comes from sort of, a, you know, just the general corruption of the world. And the other is a is a scourge that has been sent on you, and and both 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 of these things can exist, um, which I which I just thought was um quite interesting. I wanted to throw that in there. Yes, and uh, the other sort of elements of God's wrath coming down, which I want to sort of elucidate when we get to the actual siege of Jerusalem. But yes, this idea of this uh, thin line uh, between holiness mm. and uh, punishment. Uh, again, the whole idea of uh, taking the cross and the penitential act and uh, Christianity is suffering. All of these aspects which are either absent or overly simplified in the portrayal of this film, which do it a great disservice. And again, I think this this was a brilliant way to actually emphasize this with the character of Baldwin IV. But of course, um, even though Baldwin IV is the high point of the film, uh, nevertheless, there are aspects of his character which are, again, anachronistic to the period. Um, there's one little point, which is a rather trivial point, but it's in the extended version, uh, where Balian indicates his strategic mind with the suggestion of constructing a star fortification. I was going to bring that up, yes, because that infuriated me. <laughs> Don't now, even the, read. Now, here we have the Crack de Chevalier. In the 12th century, we have the... Uh, or the uh, girdled fortifications where we have a main keep surrounded by a circle of walls. However, the idea of the bastion fortifications, the Italian outline, uh, doesn't really emerge until the 16th century. Yeah. So not only After is gunpowder Bailey, and the like. Yes. So not only because again, the whole point of a uh, star fortification is to ensure that the castle is less exposed from various angles of uh, gunpowder, precisely Columba. But of course, uh, not only is Bailey 
an, a brilliant uh, strategic mind, despite he's being also a, a Leonardo he, da Vinci. He's also a Leonardo da Vinci. He's a man out of his time, <laughs> both in the metaphysical and moral sense, but also yeah. in the strategic sense. <laughs> Although, By, just... your, your grace, I've developed this AR-15. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, there's a quote the, I have the, for the, it. The, holy, the on... holy hand grenade of Antioch, you know. <laughs> <laughs> which is the fact that um, not only does the Balian of fiction seamlessly slip in to become the Balian of history with all his ability, renown, respect, uh, titles, etc. Uh, in the case of the former, this is unearned and impossible, but he supersedes that to become a man beyond his time as well. It is remarkable and I couldn't mm. help but chuckle and that, that scene really sort of is the case. Scene. I mean, it's really frustrating Although... from, from, again, a filmmaking perspective perspective the main character is the most insufferable character in the whole film you know oh. i mean he's just he's well, that's just, just the terrible. orlando bloom effect really um one thing no, that's worth mentioning... no, no, in fairness to orlando bloom it is the <laughs> it, no it's it's the anachronism you True. you try and create you try and create a bastard to allow him to have a, yes. a, a penitential journey to jerusalem in order for him to surrender jerusalem and forsake mm. the christian idea of the crusades in its entirety which is the point of the film mm. <laughs> that is the yeah. It's, it, Orlando um, Bloom's character as written is merely the vessel. Yeah, no, I yeah. know. I'm being I'm being pedantic. But one thing I, I should mention too, because we did mention the, dis the discrepancy between the director's cut and the, the theatrical uh, theatre release in, on this basis of the scene with the star fort and the discussion about strategy with the uh, with King Baldwin. And that is actually, if we if we go back to the well, not the very start of the movie, but when the Crusaders first arrive in the French village, um, in the normal theatre release, it's sort of implied that he's just merely the village blacksmith where in conversation with some of the retainers of godfrey they actually ask about his experience and he's, he's mentioned that he's been an engineer in siege and that he's served his lord in in war and in battle on horseback and in making siege weapons so at the very least in the director's cut there's actually some kind of a basis there in terms of narrative that he's actually skilled at this he's not like this pro, pro, you know prodigal blacksmith who can just you know build wonderful siege engines in jerusalem a year later you, you know there's a little bit more uh, basis to, as well to be, to be more cynical i think that was an afterthought because um, possibly but look, i'm just when, it's worth mentioning we, you know when we look at the scene where we have the ambush in the forest uh, Godfrey of Ibelin is taking him through some very basic swings with the sword. So in terms of his actual combat experience, this again puts the dampener on this as opposed to again whether this was an element added in later but yes in terms of that specific aspect the theatrical version does attempt desperately to remedy this anachronism but of course this also brings up other questions like how would he know how to irrigate um, a essentially a dry, dusty, uh, desolate territory uh, in the middle as of somewhere which he, again, he has, as a mere blacksmith. All <laughs> of these can elements... I just say, um, um, with regards to the scene about irrigation, I think that also plays in because, again, we have our um, our white girl on her gap here, and she's in the in the team, <laughs> and she looks out, what did she see? She sees... um this you know the beneficent westerner walking along there's these little um you know cheering arab children who are all happy um, yeah. and, and again and again it plays into also um um this idea of um and this is the interesting thing you know if, if we relate it back to 2005 and the war is that it you know it, it criticizes um um you know sectarian conflict yes. whatever you have that angle but you also have the angle of well we're we're building a better country aren't yes. we um it's you ironic, have that there as well it? It, uh, yeah. it criticizes the Western imperialist angle, but also playing in and celebrating the tropes that come out of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I, yes, I guess this is, a, this is a film that would infuriate everyone from the, the diehard reactionaries to the wokest of the woke. <laughs> but, in, but, but anyway, there's uh, one redeeming aspect, which is this quote, which I'll read in this entirety from Baldwin IV, when they're discussing chess. A king may move a man, a father may claim a son, but the man can also move himself, and only then, then does that man truly begin his own game. Remember that howsoever you are played or by whom, your soul is your keeping alone, even those who presume to play you be kings or men of power. And from a theological angle, this again can very much go inside with the classic uh, Christian conception that man is ultimately subject to God, and it is only to God that he is again in, 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 in determining essentially the fate of his own soul. And you know, kings can command him to do evil or whatever sort of partisan cause he may oblige him to. Uh, but this again, he may gain the world but lose his soul. So that is a a sounds sort of Christian message, but in terms of the actual sort of implications of the film, it's 
a, again, a quote which would belong in a better film, but I think for this film, taken to its logical extreme, and especially in the interpretation, which Orlando Bloom um, has um, has in terms of how he sees essentially the keeping of a soul, um, it is completely bizarre. I think the, the greatest irony, of course, is that um, only when a man can move himself, only then does he begin to play his own game. Orlando Bloom is the most passive protagonist possibly imaginable. <laughs> yeah, Every... it just happened to him, yeah. <laughs> Everything about the film is just him being strung along by events almost completely out of his control. And the only thing which he ultimately decides is that fateful moment where, again, a completely fictionalized moment, uh, he will not take up the reins of the uh, Kingdom of Jerusalem or the Regency and allow uh, Guy de Lusignor to be massacred. And this is the moment he tries to stake the sanctity of the soul by condemning the entire Kingdom of Jerusalem. And again, this is why I play into this uh, warped Christian perspective, which is almost entirely fatalistic. This world is, uh, I'm, I'm too pure for this world and I will not allow its corruption to seep in, so I will make no moral allowances <laughs> whatsoever. Wait. And allow the the temporal domain of Jerusalem to fall. So there are again major implications here. I think which which the, to the extent that the characters are a complete jumble and a and a massive uh, misrepresentation of um uh, I, I always I said I made a mistake at the start before we went live. Um, Tiberius is a representation of Raymond and Tripoli. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, I do like the scene though where he sort of puts that offer to him about um, Bailey marrying Sibylla and executing Guy um, in the director's cut. And um, obviously, Balian refutes it, and sort of Jeremy Irons' his character, Tobias, is sort of weeping, knowing that, oh, what's going to... what, what he, know, he understands what he's impending. I have to say, despite Tobias being a complete... Um, pardon the way I phrase it, but just a shit show of a character. I do like the way Irons plays it, though. Um, from a pu- really? from a purely acting standpoint, I do, actually. Yeah. Oh, I feel like see, he's... I, 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 feel, I, feel he's a, I feel he's a combination of cynical and sort of apathetic Curious. when we get to, when we get to that what i love about this scene is that the history again provides a solution um yes uh, yeah. raymond Point tripoli like what raymond tripoli was the antagonist to Baldwin. He did not want Bal- um, Raymond Tripoli to have any part in the Regency Council because, exactly. again, of his, yes. uh, of his claims on the throne. But more than that, there was never any notion that Guy de Lusignan would be executed. The idea was yes. always annulled. So the idea yes. that historically, if this situation were to arise, mm. Baldwin would ever imperil his soul was ridiculous. It is an entirely oh, contrived to allow oh, him to abandon the kingdom of Jerusalem. Ex- exact, exactly right. I was merely saying my admiration from the standpoint of acting, but not the narrative, because you're completely right. He's so full of plot holes, and it's just, it, it's completely in an inversion well, well, of actual history. That's not a, that's not a plot know? hole. It's just an inversion of history. I mean, yeah, if you exactly. set up the stakes where he needs to die in order for you to yeah. marry Sibylla, which again is a, is a fiction, but that was never Correct. the case. It was who was going to annul the marriage and who was then going to marry her. Um, so just, just again, just to, to emphasize the king's policy of peace, because this is where we get to it with the siege of Kellak. Um, the notion that, again, as with Godfrey, he was attempting to create a kingdom of conscience based on tolerance, ecumenism in the modern sense, because as Ridley Scott announced, this was very much a contemporary conception of peace, which he deliberately superimposed on this period. It is complete nonsense. The peace between Saladin and Baldwin IV was very brief. It was not a peace, it was a truce. It lasted from 1179 to 1181, and it served both of their political ends in the meantime, allowing Baldwin IV to consolidate the kingdom in the wake of this rampant factionalism, which we talked about with Raymond's attempt to coup against the Lusignor family. And Baldwin, as again, completely omitted from the film, Baldwin almost being uh, above the worldly affairs of his kingdom, Baldwin is very much concerned with expanding the royal domain at the expense of conniving nobles, which again mm-hmm. is something completely omitted from his character, which is again, demonstrated to be Christ-like, and I have to say, you know, anti-physiognomy. It's interesting, isn't it, that the, the bastard and the leper are the most saintly of all the characters. Well, yes, yes. Um, well, meanwhile, well, just, yes, um... meanwhile, uh, Saladin was eliminating Muslim opposition to his rule in Syria and Egypt. Um, it, was, it was a temporary truce so they could consolidate their own domains. It was nothing to do with, uh, we are going to bring about a kingdom of conscience with Christians and Muslims living side by side. In harmony. Well, I mean, it's, almost... it, it, it's, it's impossible. I mean, I mean, this would have absolutely crippled any, any support for either of them, if Saladin or the king had said, yes. we're going to come out and try and establish just a permanent peace 
No, that would be a, a you know, I suppose we call like a PR disaster. Essentially, well, but the first yeah. thing you sort of encounter in the film, isn't it, that you come out, the Templars apparently, according to the film, have been given the impression they go to the kingdom of Jerusalem, they kill a Saracen, and they enter into the kingdom of God, and then that is completely dispelled when, for doing that, according to the film's logic, they're going to be hanged. So, by the film's logic, also, no Templars would go to Jerusalem. All the money would dry up. There will be no conceding incentive yeah. whatsoever. So the whole basis of the Crusades, according to the film's own narrative ceases to be because Baldwin the fourth again in order to serve the film's narrative is acting in complete contradistinction with it and uh, again it's just the more you think about it I, I actually enjoyed this film more sort of uh, recollecting on it rather than having to re-watch it and research yeah. this <laughs> yeah you because just, your memory yeah yes because every sort of se a segment of this everything is wrong and this comes to the the war and the siege of Kerak and the introduction of Reynaud of Chatillon and of course we have the meme moment where we have the attack on the Muslim caravan and we have oh, the God yeah. wills it Deus Bolt moment where both uh, Guy de Lusignan and Reynaud de Chatillon uh, persecute this and this is this is what I mean by insidious there is an element of truth to this but it is grossly oversimplified and perverted. And Reynaud de Chatillon, again, is a fascinating character who it is worth digging up and doing more research on him uh, because he was essentially one of the most notorious and controversial men in the Outremer, but not necessarily in the way that the film presents him. Uh, he was known, renowned for his aggressive raids, which were directed both at Orthodox Christians and Muslims. 30 years before the events of the film, uh, he had been the second greatest lord of all the Outremer, uh, marrying uh, the princess of Antioch and becoming the prince of Antioch, uh, where he led a raiding party into Byzantine Cyprus, leading to a Byzantine reprisal, where he had to deliver a humiliating submission to the emperor. Um, thereafter, he led another raiding party from Antioch and was captured by Muslims near Aleppo. There is an imprisonment historically, but it is not an imprisonment by Baldwin. It is an imprisonment by Muslims for 15 years before uh, the Crusaders are able to pay his ransom and release him. And somehow I think spending 15 years in a Muslim prison might color your attitude <laughs> a little bit. But again, none of this and none of the backstory and none of the motivation is demonstrated by this character. He simply appears as a bigoted, ruthless coward mm -hmm. who likes massacring Muslims and he remains that character with no yeah. progression throughout the end he's, until he's, he is executed he's, he's, by Salah he's, al not, he's nothing but a vessel to convey the worst vices being portrayed in this movie of the villains, essentially. Well, I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of... Um... <laughs> I can't remember the name of the character, but um, um, you remember in Platoon by Oliver Stone, you know, the one with the scar over his face who just, you know, likes oh, to yeah. shoot, um, shoot the little Vietnamese by, children. The one you know, played by Tom Berenger. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and he just, he just yeah. enjoys war, he enjoys he, the blood, he enjoys... And he, and he shoots his fellow kind of, officer in the back, yeah, like he's a real yeah, scumbag. It, it's yeah. just, um, it, um, it's almost another another trope, yeah. and, and in that sense, this film, it does remind me of a lot of those, you know, the, the Vietnam, the war movie, um, you have the same you know, sort of stock of characters. Yeah, and, and the, the, just going back to the, the Reynolds thing just quickly, you know, it's like the bit, I, I know we're just stepping forward ever so slightly, but this is another reference to his sort of the villainy, the pure villainy that's conveyed in, in this movie to the point of caricature and beyond, is when he's in the prison, and again, if you compare the th theatrical release to the director's cut, he says a different thing because he's sort of in, in these like undergarments, he's like mm -hmm, dancing around, and of course um, in his cell and... Um, and Guy comes in with like his armor and his sword to release him. And in the theoretical cut, it's oh, the king is dead. And then in the director's cut, oh, it's the boy is dead in reference to the prince, who we'll get to that later. Yes. But he's like very celebratory of these tragic events, which yes. uh, just does not coincide with history yes. remotely. It's just yes. another way to convey the caricature. Give, give me a war. That's what I do. <laughs> it's just it's, <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's 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 obscene uh, just to, to illustrate the history of this character i mean upon his release he becomes the lord through marriage to the uh outre jordain which is going on this map it is the extreme southern segment uh essentially the the great strategic uh segment which uh, around uh the modern city of Aqaba, which separates the Sinai Peninsula from the Syrian yeah. desert, and therefore, therefore yeah. divides the Muslim territory in two. And yeah. occupying he was responsible for the entire Negev, essentially, because that's all desert, more or less. 
Yes, and but also with str possible striking distance to mm. uh, hurt the pilgrimages, the the right. Hajis to uh, Medina and Mecca at the same mm. time. Exactly. So it is a it is a key uh, strategic lo location, and understanding the utility of it. Um, uh, Reynaud de Chatillon conducted more raids into Muslim territory with the eye again of threatening Mecca or Medina. Um, but in terms of his motivation for this, the film's motivation is almost a bloodlust just to kill Muslims for the sake of it. Um, in terms of the actual sort of motivation for his character, one is the accumulation of wealth and beauty. Um, he was also an incredibly wealthy man and an incredibly ambitious man, and he was certainly one of the most uh, powerful men within the Kingdom of Jerusalem because of this, and of course his uh, ability to uh, strategically marry, uh, for example, the, the widower of the of the Jordan. Um, but nevertheless, there was also the consideration, the legitimate, legitimate, legitimate consideration that during this peace, as we mentioned, the peace was not this idea of great tolerance, but it was an, it gave Saladin the, the ability to consolidate the domains in Syria against his erstwhile uh, rivals and uh, former uh, masters, actually, the Zengid uh, Turkish dynasty in Aleppo. And what we see with the attacks on the caravans, possibly, again, is a preemptive strike against Salah al-Din to prevent him uniting and completing the complete um, encirclement of the Altrim estates in Jerusalem, and also to compel the king to adopt a more offensive strategy, which works, it should be noted. Again, against the uh, betrayal of the film, which is completely fictional, uh, the king, Julie, again, he tries to rein in Reynald. When Reynald refuses, um, the king adopts a more aggressive um, strategy, and so does Salah al-Din. Uh, Salah al-Din believes the Christian uh, situation in the Archimedes is incredibly weak because we have uh, the rise of um, uh, Alexios, is it Andronikos? Oh, no, Andronikos uh, Komnenos. Uh, in Constantinople, yes, who yes, begins yes, his from, uh, uh, Trebizond. Yes, and we see the the massacre of the Latins, mm -hmm. the uh, the Venetians, and the Genoese within the city of Jerusalem. So mm -hmm. the relations between Orthodox Christians and Catholics are at an all time low. Uh, mm -hmm. Saladin was concerned about possible Byzantine reprisals. He's not concerned about that now. He doesn't believe they'll mm -hmm. come to their rescue. So he begins closing in, and in response, mm -hmm. Baldwin actually goes as so far as to um, attack uh, his capital at Damascus. Um, and Saladin responds and is defeated by Baldwin personally at the Battle of Le Forbelet. Uh, Saladin uh, sieges Beirut. And um, again, it's during this time that Sal Saladin, despite the attempt to engage in a preemptive strategy around de Chatillon, he annexes Aleppo in 1182 and completes the full encirclement. And with an army directed from the south, Saladin attacks uh, the city of Kadak. And it's during this time that Baldwin, who is now, his his eyelids have withered away, he's now blind. Um, he is virtually incapacitated. He needs to be driven on litter everywhere. He has to begin to seriously delegate his authority and thinking about the issue of the succession. Now, before then, he had been favoring Guy, but when Guy is made regent, Guy shows no sort of initiative or ability in tactical affairs. And Contrary to the way he's portrayed in the film, he has very little experience or interest in this either. And as a result of this, uh, Baldwin is forced to take to the field personally several times. Um, and it is merely the notion of um, the king arriving uh, to lift the siege of Kerak that compels Salah ad -Din to um, lift the siege. There is no great parley and there is no punishment of Reynaud of Chatillon. If anything, again, Reynaud of Chatillon uh, was at Again, just look at the betrayal of the film. Um, we have this is essentially the moment where Balian uh, shows his worth and is able to demonstrate his uh, complete selflessness uh, by saving a few villagers. Well, who was actually responsible for that historically? Reynaud of Chatillon as he was directing people into the castle of Kerak. Instead, in the film, he is displayed as drunk, disrobed, unarmored, stuffing his face king, with food, stuffing his face. What of it? Oh, I'm just, I'm just looking at this, this night. I don't care what he does. It's just, it's just, it's just, yeah. it's ridiculous. And, actually, and, actually, know, actually, Bailey, actually, Bailey, actually, actually, I, actually, he actually, he looks over the gatehouse and when people come in, he's yelling visitors, you know, I know <laughs> like he's, he's having a banquet. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, the, the, the irony is there was a banquet. Uh, there was a banquet oh, because yes, Isabella but... was being married to his stepson, Humphrey of yes. Turol. And this is another motivation why Baldwin IV had to go and relieve the city, also to save his uh, uh, his half-sister, uh, Isabella. Um, and th there's also another little thing I'd like to mention, is that this, historically, 
actually inspired the lighting of the beacons in Lord of the Rings, because we have the lighting of the beacon on the Tower of David in Jerusalem, and we have a chain of beacons lighting all the way to Kerak, which motivates the defenders of Kerak to know that the king is coming. So that actual history, that actual illusion in Lord of the Rings comes mm. from this moment. And of course, completely omitted from the film, even after the Lord of the Rings. We could yeah. have even sort of made a, um, an interesting little reference to it. Um, but nevertheless, Baldwin, again, despite not parlaying with Saladin at this battle, uh, Baldwin is the one who, put, uh, again, continues the peace, ensures the continuation of the Kingdom of Conscience. Uh, Balian almost sacrifices his life, and we get the moment where he's able to be redeemed in the favor of Alexander Siddig. Uh, again, none of this really happened. Um, and Baldwin strikes Reynard before having Tiberius arrest him. That again never happened. Reynard was an important figure and a key power broker um, over the succession issue. Um, he was not in prison and then unleashed by Guy de Lusignan upon becoming king to wage a war. All of this is uh, made up. And now we enter the issue of the succession and Guy essentially being proven to be incompetent and Baldwin having to try and find a replacement for him. Uh, but all of this nuance is left. However, there is something I would like to give the film a bit of uh, a bit of credit. Um, when we return to Salah al-Din's camp, uh, we have a character which the film credits as Mullah, uh, played by Khalid Nabari, um, who implores Saladin to wage war asking why they did not attack and reminding Salah al-Din of a promise to take Jerusalem. Yeah. Now, not looking at the uh, credits before and uh, trying to find out who this character was, I always thought he was either the Abbasid Caliph al-Nasir or a representative of the Halif, because Saladin's, again, all of this is gone. Um, there, there is one line which alludes to it, uh, which is, um, why were the Muslims uh, facing such a disastrous turn of events before I came? It is because we were sinful. Well, there is an element of truth to which the Muslims would have believed that because Salah al-Din's rise coincides with the fall of a Shia Muslim state in Fatimid Egypt and the rise, or rather the sort of uh, the renaissance of the Muslim power, of the Muslim Sunni power base in uh, the Abbasid uh, capital of Baghdad. And it is through Salah al-Din's alliance with the Abbasid Halif um, that we essentially Saladin is permitted to rise and consolidate all of these territories because Salah al-Din started off as barely anyone. He was a mere commander of the uh, Turkish uh, emir of Aleppo, uh, Nur al-Din, who was essentially sent to uh, serve the ally of Nur al-Din, the Fatimid Caliph. Saladin served as the only Sunni vizier and the last vizier, um, dissolving it when we have the death of the last Fatimid Caliph in 1171. Mm. And from 1171 to 1182, Salah al-Din wages war on his old um, masters after the death of um, Nur al-Din, the Zengids uh, of the, the Seleuk remnant in Syria, and enters into Damascus peacefully. But this comes with a cost because he's not, he's only very half-heartedly directing his attack against the Crusader states. Barely any territory has been gained. Um, and in order to justify this, he makes a political deal with the Abbasid Halif. The Halif is very happy to see the rise of a Muslim Sunni power in Egypt, where previously there was his uh, Shia rival. Um, but nevertheless, um, in order to justify this conquest, in particular, this is the uh, annexation of the city of Mosul um, in modern-day Iraq, but also uh, it should be known, should mentioned that uh, in terms of his ethnic uh, disposition, Salah ad-Din was Kurdish, yeah. that um, a potential jihad had to be a legitimizing factor in Saladin's uh, consolidation and conquest of all of his Muslim neighbors, which again is something completely absent from the film. So where, and, um, where, where was the, um, the caliph um, based at this time? In Baghdad. In like Baghdad, that, of course. Because this, uh, this, this is prior to this destruction by the Mongols, obviously. Yes. Yeah, by, yeah, yeah. yes. Baghdad and is still... So. And uh, al-Nasir is interesting because he sort of represents one of the last political attempts by the Abbasids to reclaim some form of real authority after centuries and centuries of decline. You know, they've been in power since the 8th century, but now their political power base has reduced, 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 and now Salah ad-Din represents a unique opportunity to recover uh, some of that political power. And this is where we come to the a promise which was indicated in that film, uh, he promised to take Jerusalem. Well, specifically, um, in order to have the Halif recognize Salah al Din's conquest of Mosul, uh, Salah al Din promised to take Jerusalem and Constantinople and the entire Maghreb at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, there's a bit of bleed through coming through. Um, oh. 
So that is the basis um, for the continuation of Salah al-Din. And it is also why he is actually under a strict sort of political timetable to rededicate his forces away from Muslim uh, principalities and attack the Outrema Christian states. And this is very subtly referenced in the film somewhat accurately, albeit in oversimplified fashion. But it's just something that I would allude to, which actually has some historical basis, which is very <laughs> rare. But of course it's referring but of course it's referring to the Muslims, not the Christians. Yeah. So I should expect that. <laughs> that, that, that also yeah, that well, also yes, ties yes, into a uh, scene that, that also ties into a scene earlier in the film too where uh, where things where Tiberius meets Balian in the the office of the Marshal of the of Jerusalem and he makes a statement that um you know when he says oh you know the kingdom is kept by the peace between Baldwin our king and Saladin etc you know there's a humanitarian kind of tangent he goes on um but he he make he makes he mentions the the line where um Saladin, Saladin could take this kingdom if he if he would he has 200,000 men in Damascus alone uh, there's no way that uh, Saladin had anywhere near that kind of fighting strength, and um, no. certainly not concentrated in one city. It's again no. a misrepresentation to try and sort of uh, portray the mercy of the balance Muslims. of powers. Exactly, yeah, when it doesn't exist that way. And he wasn't just sitting there like a hawk waiting for an opportunity no, to strike. No, he was fighting other Muslims. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Yeah, he was consolidating his power through Syria and through central Iraq, etc. Um, so, attempting um, to sort of keep his his perimeter territory essentially in check, and like you say, consolidate his power from rival Islamic entities. Indeed. So, so now that we're um, we're getting onto the succession, um, another point which I suppose uh, one could argue is inspired by the real history. Of course, there's the scene which I thought was quite quite a good scene where um, um young Baldwin the fifth, um, you know, he puts his hand over the candle, and and, mm -hmm. and you know that he's got um he's got leprosy, and then his mother finds out. And his mother, Sibylla, poisons him. Um, now, this is interesting because I, I believe, if I'm mistaken, I'm sure AM will pull me up, but we don't exactly know um, the circumstances of young no. Baldwin's death. And there are, um, I there believe, were rumors. I, yes, I there believe were rumors it's um, Heraclius talked it about was, poison. Yeah. But it, was, it wasn't directed at Sibylla, it was actually directed against Raymond. <laughs> No, 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 no. I, 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 I meant, I meant more. Of that was the chronicle that that, that reported it. But yes. Uh, um... Oh no, but there, there, there was a notion. But but again, this idea of um, I, I think this was an attempt to try and give Sibylla some sort of story arc or some sort of yes. Tragic because then downfall. she becomes a sort of she cuts her hair and turns and some sentence. depth as well, like of character, not just being this sort of she. Because in the theoretical the release, there's, 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 there's a look there's there's this sense of like she's like this sort of wispy princess who like has a dull dalliance with Balian, but then she's like this stray wife, and there's nothing more to her. Whereas the son in the director's cut adds a bit more, you know, meat and potatoes in the in the plot, so to speak. Not that there's much more, but it is a something like you say to try and add some, I think, plot depth for Sibylla, which is otherwise pretty she, happy. Um, she runs off with him in the end, doesn't she? But mm. Nevertheless. There is historical depth to her, which is abandoned in this film, exactly. which gets onto yeah. her role in the succession. Of course, in the I, I can't actually remember the differentiation between the theatrical version and the uh, the extended version. Uh, but of course, in the theatrical version, Baldwin the Fourth and Tiberius plot against Guy um, in order. In the, th in the if I remember correctly, in the extended version, does it still happen? But he's off with the regency instead of the kingdom. Yes, that's the way it, it formulates. Yeah, because in in the th in the retro release, basically Bailey would become like uh, the king to to uh, Sibylla's queen. Whereas in the director's cut, uh, Bailey would become regent to Bal the younger Baldwin. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is uh, supposedly based on his heroics at Karak, which also gives uh, both Reynaud de Chatillon, uh, he suggested he to kill Balian. Again, this this never happens. Uh, the whole attempted assassination by the Templars is all just complete nonsense as well. But also in the extended version, we have the introduction of the patriarch Heraclius. Oh, here um, we go. <laughs> uh, and Baldwin refuses to give his confession and receive supreme unction by Patriarch Heraclius, uh, which has implications as to whether he despises the character or as to whether he's lost his faith in God, mm. because the whole notion of confession and receiving the sacraments is that the priest doesn't have any special power in and of himself. He is merely the conduit for divine power. And so there are 
major implications, both political and theological, uh, of the king refusing this. But nevertheless, all of this is to hint in the film that Heraclius is one of these these evil dogmatic uh, uh, re religionists. Um, yes, who religion religion we, exists solely to uh, as a means to an end, right? Yeah, so it's, it simply mean it, it, it exists simply to control the minds of weak yeah. and feeble people and keep them sustained in an attitude of fanaticism and hatred towards people of other mm -hmm. religions, which do the same just to a lesser extent. But again, so I mean, how, how absurd, <laughs> how absurd that a king in the Middle Ages on his deathbed would refuse confession. I mean, it's just... And, and John, this again, just to emphasize this, Heraclius was an ally of Baldwin IV, mm -hmm. a, you know, a sworn ally who supported the king in his attempts to annul the marriage between Sibylla and Guy after Guy had failed in his duty as regent. Um, Heraclius was often described as his contemporaries as via sanctus et prudence, a holy and wise man. Mm. Um, and, and again, this is an element where we have the old French continuation of William of Tyre, uh, which is one of the main sources for this film, uh, where we see, again, a mixed interpretation of him, which one often sort of portrays him as pompous and obsessed with finery and financially corrupt, but never sort of religiously corrupt. Mm -hmm. um, so that again is almost, an, that's an invention. I, I think it's fair to say not by the film, but um, almost, inherited from the negative appraisal uh, from the old uh, French continuation of William of Tyre. Nevertheless, this hasn't been substantiated by any sort of more recent scholarship. And here we have the, the main crux of the succession issue, which is bringing Guy into obedience or compelling him to annul. Um, the king begins dispossessing Guy of some territories. Uh, Guy responds rather childishly by refusing any summons from the king. The king even knocks on his uh, Guy's castle in order to gain entry with the whole court assembled, and Guy refuses access to the king. <laughs> I know that sounds ridiculous. And Sybil, Sibylla, throughout this entire time, um, is on the side of Guy de Lusignan. And now Baldwin is focusing on bypassing his sister, Sibylla, in the succession and trying to elevate his half-sister, um, Isabella, and her and her son, Baldwin V. Who but I mean, I mean, these sort of these sort of dramatic displays were common in the time. I and mean, wasn't it one of um, Balian's own brothers, uh, Barrison, who sort of refused to do homage as well? Baldwin. Um, I believe he had uh, a brother called Bar Barrison. Barrison you know? Hugh and Baldwin. Barrison was the father. Oh, okay. My bad. Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's easy to uh, to confuse this name. So, yes, many, many things like this happened in particular. But it's interesting to see the uh, the decrepit uh, king suffering from the advanced leprosy, having just fought a major campaign, returning blind and knocking on the door with the whole high court. <laughs> yeah, you have, to, you have to admire Baldwin, don't you? I mean, whether it's the film or the real man, I mean, no, he he's some he, will. Tenacious, incredibly yeah. tenacious. But, but again... Uh, brutal as well. Um, we only see a hint of that in the film with his with his designs on killing Guy uh, to contrive this marriage between Bailey of Iblin and Sibylla. Uh, but the real character of Bailey of Baldwin IV was tenacious in terms of the ability to execute the authority and the prerogatives as King of Jerusalem. And the, the final straw came when Baldwin IV was intent on escheating the entire county of Jaffa and Ascalon. And that's one of the the, one of the four great counties of the Kingdom of Jerusalem away from Guy and returning mm. them uh, to the royal uh, domain. And Heraclius and many of the holy orders, the Templars, actually intercede here and say that if the king were to do this, the king in persecuting Guy is trying to prevent a civil war, but in persecuting Guy to this extent, he sets a precedent that none of the nobility are safe in their rights mm -hmm. and would thus an, initiate a civil war of all the nobility against the monarchy, so therefore defeating Baldwin's original purpose. There is a brief estrangement between Heraclius and Baldwin IV because Heraclius would not support the king in this measure. Nevertheless, within due time, Heraclius and Baldwin are reconciled and Heraclius is sent to the court of Henry II in Chinon and then goes over to England and sets up a, uh, a, a Templar headquarters in England to enlist aid for Jerusalem. Yes, and I'm it's pretty sure this... um, Henry II sent money as well, did he not? Yes. And it is during this time that Baldwin died. So this scene where Heraclius is denied the ability to grant uh, supreme unction and confession to the king could never have happened because Heraclius was in England at the time. Mm. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's also, um, it's quite absurd if you're coming at it from that personal angle, if you choose to interpret it that way. Because, I mean, you know, can, can, the, can the king not find another, another confessor in Jerusalem? I mean... 
yes, which brings into question the the implications of skepticism regarding yes. uh, sacraments and the sacramental nature of uh, the Christian Church, not just the personages of uh, of the priest. Um, but again, it's only under this extreme uh, situation where the king is desperate that he reluctantly confers the regency on Raymond of Tripoli, Tiberius, <laughs> again, in complete contrast to the uh, doting atmosphere that we have uh, between those two characters in the film. And uh, the king actually distrusts Raymond of Tripoli so much that he doesn't give him the ability to raise the child. Instead, he give it to, gives it to another noble, uh, de Courtenay. And Ibelin is the final member sort of hoisting up the young king as part of this uh, new royal triumvirate. And uh, it's this image here on the left of the uh, the various nobles supporting the reign of the young king. And as well, that you was actually um, that was actually during the coronation. Bailey yes, during the coronation, the, yeah. the young king, yeah. Yes. And it's during this time, as you mentioned, Columba, that very soon afterwards, we have that scene where Sibylla notices that the king mm. doesn't feel the, uh, uh, is it the ink? It's, um, it, yeah, it's, 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 well, you see the hot the wax. where he puts it over the candle. The hot wax, yeah, yes, it's the hot wax yeah. uh, mm. being dropped on his, and, and, you know, obviously early, early signs of uh, leprosy, as with her brother who suffered leprosy mm. um, as an adolescent. And it is, again, the, the early stages of leprosy induce Sibylla to kill him. And mm. there's uh, the catalyst in the film is that Baldwin the Fourth, his last words, I believe, to Sibylla. Um, remember me as I was, she refused to let this go. She takes off the mask. She sees his uh, decaying face yeah. and she sees that face in her son. And that is mm. the motivation to mercy yeah. kill him. It's presented well, as I, a, I, would say, um, I would say that there's also the, a, um, a, a from, again, from a sort of a film perspective, there's a thematic sort of continuance there, isn't there? Because Bailey and at the start of the film, his wife, her son dies and then she kills yes. herself. In this case, now she's killing her son. Um, so there is a sort of um, mm. a theme Wrong reversal, there as well, almost. Yeah. yeah. And then just just on the point about the wax, just briefly, because uh, there's a scene where later Tiberius and Sibylla are talking about, um, oh yes, these rumors are circulating in the court, and we just have to suppress them immediately. And Tiberius suggests suggests that the prince, young Prince Baldwin, has to be seen being active and not suffering from these early symptoms of leprosy. Yes. Yeah. Because because w w in that scene where he passes over the parchment or the the, the paper, or whatever. And he, his wax hits his hand. Her Heraclius also noticed it, and he's seen an eyebrow raise. Mm. And that basically is implied that it's probably Heraclius in the movie circulating these rumors in the court. It's it's never confirmed, yes. but it's suggested to the audience that that's the case. Yes. Heraclius is not portrayed as the ally of the young king. He's very much portrayed as a partisan for the opposition, again, in opposition to his historical role. Um, but again, that's neither here or there. Baldwin V is now dead, an extended version. And historically, and this is a thing I really hate and why I will object to anyone who claims that Sibylla has any depth uh, whatsoever, because this is the case of both the extended version and the theatrical version. Is that Sibylla hates Guy, and yet there's a fatalism uh, which encompasses the coronation of Guy, which is in complete contrast to the initiative that Sibylla took in crowning her husband. Because now there was the real possibility of civil war. There were two serious contenders, Sibylla and her half-sister Isabella. Isabella, of course, had been elevated in the succession by Baldwin IV. Isabella is a character conveniently omitted from the film. Uh, arguably, you can say not to conflict things, but in reality, all this does is destroy the character of Sibylla. Because and, all it was, does um, is... and was Isabella Balian's daughter? Or... No, Isabella was uh, Baldwin's half sister. There was a bit of controversy actually because okay. both Baldwin the Fourth and his older sister Sibylla uh, were legitimized, and Isabella was the only, again, purely sort of legitimized um, scion. I think it was of uh, Baldwin the Third. So there was a little bit of controversy as to whether Isabella actually had a better claim. Uh, than Sibylla on the throne. Um, and this is where we see the division of the court into various factions with Maria Comnene, the wife of, um, again, the Queen Dowager, the wife of Balian of Ibelin, and Reynaud opposing Sibylla and Guy, who crucially have the support of Reynaud de Chatillon, who isn't in prison. And it is Sibylla who suggests a solution to an impasse where she would annul her marriage to Guy and the future husband will become king, assuming it would be a part of the opposition faction. Uh, the compromise was accepted. Heraclius crowns her um, as Queen of Jerusalem, only then for Sibylla to dramatically betray the opposing faction by giving the crown to Guy mm. to crown himself as King of Jerusalem. 
And civil war was only prevented in this instance. And again, all of this is omitted from film and all these characters don't exist in the film. Uh, when Humphrey of Touron, the stepson of Reynaud of Chatillon, who was married to Isabella, that was the yeah, famous royal wedding we saw in Carac. Uh, Humphrey of Touron refused to step up and say, I will be a counter king and I will use utilize my wife's claim. It is that and his submission to his stepfather, Reynaud de Chatillon, which prevents a uh, Isabella acting as a serious contender and prevents a civil war from happening. So Sibylla has ensured the succession of Guy on her own initiative. Yeah. Nothing I mean, I mean, you even what um, we see in the film. You even see this in um, manuscript depictions of the event. You see Sibylla sitting on the throne and, and quite unusually handing the crown to Guy. Um, you know, so 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 even at the time there was this clear perception that she had a you know a lot of agency in this uh, yes. in this move in this decision. She, the, the crown, the crown Jura Oxoris, the crown by yes, by, by, by the right, right, right of my wife. Every, and again, this isn't just a legal fact, it is a personal fact, which is again completely omitted from the film. And if you're going to actually talk about a redemption arc, Sibylla in the theatrical version certainly has absolutely no reason to atone for anything because she passively accepts her fate when uh, Balian of Ibelin refuses to stand up. Thereafter, Sibylla just becomes a, again, a motionless, agentless cipher. Whereas if, again, this was portrayed historically, and Sibylla was demonstrated as having been responsible for the elevation of Guy, and were the events of the film to contrive a, a very unsympathetic attitude towards Guy, that Guy was responsible for the downfall of Jerusalem, then conceivably, at least in the fictionalized settings, this didn't happen historically, Sibylla can be seen to have motivation. So in the theatrical version, it's absurd, and this is remedied somewhat in the extended version, where we have her atoning for the death of her son. But again, in that sense, she is both an idiot and uh, desperate, and the fact that she's portrayed, portrayed to, uh, prepared to mercy kill her son due to her own obsession with her brother's leprosy to ensure that someone she is estranged from, a monster, becomes king. It's I'm not happy with any of these situations. <laughs> it, feels, and any it feels very ham-fisted of the plot, character. doesn't it? Yes. Absolutely. Mm. And of course, mm. it's from here that, you know, Balian survives the assassination by Templars, which never happened. Also bollocks, yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, uh, and this is one of the most ridiculous, uh, but, but again, there's a hint of historical truth to it, because there is a possible citation to this in the continuation of the old French account of William of Tyre, which is Reynaud murdering Saladin's sister. Now, mm. historically, Reynaud had been the principal backer behind Guy's ascension. He wasn't, like we said, released from prison in order to uh, wreak havoc and let slip the dogs of war. Um, and he was briefly the most powerful man in Jerusalem as the kingmaker, the man who unequivocally stood behind the candidacy of Sibylla and Guy. Um, as we mentioned, there was no instance of the imprisonment of Reynaud. Um, and it's here again, as we saw with the first uh, siege with Kerak, Reynaud, on his own initiative, without Guy's support, seized a caravan passing through the Alta Jordain, um, possibly under the pretext that such a caravan was armed, and to send that caravan was an act of war by passing through the realm of the mm. Kingdom of Jerusalem. The capture of Saladin's myth was perpetuated by this account, which is also um, part of the, the wider sort of uh, Histoire de Heracles. Uh, Guy's murder of the envoy um, is a completely infamous fabrication in this film, as Guy was almost certainly a weak king who had attempted to placate Saladin only again as with Baldwin to be forced by Reynaud when he again rebuffed the king and wanted to take an aggressive strategy. So Guy was nothing more really than the pawn of Reynaud de Chatillon executing the Kingdom of Jerusalem's um, foreign policy. Whereas in the film, Guy is demonstrated to be a fanatic and butcher of the worst kind in murdering the envoy of Salah al-Din and sending the body back to Damascus. And it's really that scene, probably more than any other scene, which really tries to hammer home how evil these Christians are. Yeah. And um, the, there is no excusing it. It's a complete fabrication. All It only exists in the mind of Ridley Scott and his perverted conception of uh, medieval Christianity. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you could find some parallels in Romania. <laughs> okay. Valachia, specifically. <laughs> yes, we can uh, We can talk about uh, Vlad the Impaler. Or was that your reference you were trying to make? Yes, that's what I was going for. Good. So Saladin now has his pretext provided by Reynaud de Chatillon 
to attack Jerusalem. And specifically, Salah al-Din wants to take on Reynald de Chatillon. He wants to execute him. What Salah al-Din interprets as Reynald's uh, blatant uh, misuse of the truce. And Reynald attacks one of Raymond de Tripoli's uh, fortress, Tiberias, which is where we get the, the name utilized in the film. And Raymond and the Hospitaller, again in the film, uh, well, well, sorry, rather in real life, um, there was no sort of great standoff between the factions. There is unity um, in, again, the desire to stand behind the king, but there is disunity in terms of what strategy to take. Mm -hmm. uh, Raymond of Tripoli advised Guy not to engage, believing that the fortress will hold out, and that after a recent uh, battle, the Battle of Cresson, uh, led by Gerard de Huitfort, um, the Templars were simply not in any position to win a battle against Saladin mm. on the field. However, Gerard advised to the king that you have been financed by, among others, Henry II, with the support of Heraclius, to raise this great army of some 20,000 men. And if you don't give battle now against Salah al-Din, you're going to have to disband the army because you can't afford to maintain it in essentially a, in a long defensive war. So you can fight now, defeat Salah al-Din, and then disband the army. Otherwise, the army would have served no purpose. And it's that's primarily, it's, at least to me, the reason as to why the king was reluctantly convinced to accept Gerard, again, this is not a figure that exists in the film, uh, to attack at, again, contrive the situation, the Battle of Hattin. But again, um, all of the following evidence, all, all the, the enemies are betrayed as, you know, uh, sorry, Guy de Lucien is betrayed as an idiot, and Tiberius refused to participate in, again, what they prophetically know to be a lost Battle of Hattin. Both of them participated in the battle under Guy de Lusignan. He did not blindly march his army through the desert without water to be massacred. And again, a little film trick, uh, Balian miraculously knows when irrigating the uh, the wastes, the dry lands of Iblin, that the land needs water. So that's his special power to know that an army needs water to sustain it. And this is what he brings <laughs> Yeah, he's a, real, he's a real Sun Tzu, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I mean the, whole point, the, the whole point was to surprise a besieging force, right? Yes, th that's exactly. The, well, well, again, it's, it was really rather desperation. I don't think it was um, surprise because Salah al-Din used it deliberately as a bait to lure out the army because mm -hmm. Guy had positioned himself in a fortified location with access to a spring, obviously being privy to the access, the idea that an army needs water to sustain <laughs> it. However, it's only when Saladin relentlessly attacks Tiberius, he breaches the walls. Uh, uh, Raymond de Tripoli's wife is in the keep and um, essentially most of the town has now fallen. It's only when the city of Tiberius looks almost certain to fall to Salah al-Din. Um, and again, Salah al-Din really contrives this to give the Crusaders the best possible excuse to ride out and, and rescue the sieges. Does Guy de Lusignan move away from this fortified, secure location to um, relieve the siege, where Salah al-Din, of course, has betrayed, uh, prepared his trap by having his main army behind the Crusaders in the Golan Heights, some 40,000 men outnumbering the Crusaders two to one, where they are massacred. So this was a brilliant mm. tactical ploy by Salah al-Din. It wasn't the Crusaders being so stupid as to just march aimlessly into the desert and be massacred as portrayed in the film. Mm. And, and and it's really explicit whereby in the film, um, you sort of see there's that quite telling scene where um, Guy and uh, uh, Renald are at the front of their army and this just to sort of exacerbate the villainy even more they're seen holding their canteens and drinking this water and and they splash water on their arm and, and you hear the sizzling all the armies yes yeah. i know it, uh. you just hear the sizzling of the water on this hot metal meanwhile there's these poor footmen just like literally falling over and dying straggling at the back of the army out of pure exhaustion and dehydration it. it's just it. it's just it. such I a I can't oh. i can't stand it. it it makes me it's agonizing <laughs> seething Yes. With anger but, at this, uh... but, but for and and obviously I I don't want to go on a full like battle summary tangent, but I will say this much that uh, Saladin's assault of Tiberius and him utilizing the that as bait to draw out the Crusader army was actually um, I would I would say he's more so even the capture of the city itself, Saladin's sort of tactical um, magnus opus. It was his. It was his probably his greatest set piece military exercise, in my opinion. Absolutely. Can I, can I, mean, can I ask a question sorry, sure. um, re regarding this um, this siege of um, Tiberias? Because, of course, 
um you you say that the the wife of um um lord of tripoli was in the castle and and uh, you know there's this fear amongst the crusaders about um, what saladin's going to do once they take the town once they take the keep and and this is of course um you know we'll have to sort of get a bit into the sort of the legend around saladin because he's known as a as a you know a particularly humane um 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 muslim leader war leader um even in, even in the middle ages famously dante has him in limbo with men like um, mm. um you know lucius Junius brutus and sort of virtuous pagans and and what have you um yeah so he's considered to be quite a noble man but i mean what was his history of of sort of behavior when he was taking cities what what would the crusaders have expected him to do um were they expecting ruthless slaughter did he have well, they, a reputation they didn't know for... really what to they didn't really know what to expect because as we've but that would imply that he about... doesn't have that reputation right not now because the crusade he, like i said he's been focusing his attacks mainly on muslim cities where his strategy has been to try and take the cities without a fight to merely pacify uh, the Muslim cities and unite mm. them under his banner rather than engage in meaningless slaughter, which would only damage his reputation and damage his political situation. But in terms of a wholesale attack and wholesale taking of cities, like I said, he's mainly been uh, directing his attacks towards Muslims, not towards Christians. And it's only now that he's beginning the wholesale conquest of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. One of the effects of Hattin is that so many cities because you have the complete annihilation of the crusader army and the kingdom of jerusalem isn't a major kingdom in the sense that you can draw peasant levies the entire army is essentially a imported mercenary army from abroad so when you lose the main army you've lost the entire kingdom there's no one left to defend it other than a couple of stragglers as we see even with the case of jerusalem so these undefended cities are nothing essentially to Saladin as he sweeps through and one of the effects of Raymond of Tripoli is that he abandons all of his uh, cities with the exception of Tripoli even uh, Tyre which is his uh, his crown jewel uh, so to speak and one I of mean the I suppose it's better it's better to have one very well defended capital than rather than trying to defend too much cities. yes yeah. yes so it was like I said, you know, like you said, uh, Marcus, uh, the magnum opus of Salah al Din, it was a complete and total victory. And as portrayed in the film, both Guy and Reynaud of Chatillon are captured. And in the film, uh, it seems to be the mullah inducing again Salah al Din, giving him a sword uh, to King Ren kill Reynaud, even though he then kills him with his own sword. Um, and this is very similar to what we have in the Talisman, where we uh, see Salah al Din. Uh, murdering uh, Conrad, who of course was responsible for the murder of Amory. Um, and there's one uh, quote which I actually quite like, but again, it's completely anachronistic in it. If I like this quote, I have to sort of legitimize the rest of the film. <laughs> uh, when he says, uh, Were you not close enough to a great king to learn by his example? Because if you watch closely, when Guy was in Kerak and witnessing the dressing down of Reynaud de Chatillon, uh, Baldwin declares that I am Jerusalem and then he mutters that in a moment very much trying to resemble and imitate the affectations of the king before declaring assemble the army in a similar fashion to when Baldwin IV assembled the army. So the mm. implication here is that he was close enough but he learned the wrong things from him. Yeah. He learned the superficial aspects, yes. the magisterial aspects. So, But, but again, it, it, these are tiny little things which would elevate uh, you yeah. know, the film, but the film hasn't earned the right to have but, those little moments. But funny, but funny you mentioned the affectation because there's a third time that's mimicked and that's when they're in the war tent with the war council deciding to actually march out to Hattin and actually and this is why I think Martin uh, I forgot how to pronounce his last name uh, Sock, Sock House or whatever it is he really does it well where he's about to sort of say I am about to say Jerusalem and then Bailey walks in and then he goes the king <laughs> He yes. actually can't bring himself to say, I am Jerusalem in the presence of Balian, which, yes. you know, whether uh, obviously there's no basis of truth in that, but I, I like what they're actually attempting to do from a, um, you know, like just a narrative plot perspective. It's probably one of the few bits of the film that film that is, I actually considered kind of ingenious. No, really, really to emphasize that, Marcus, there are aspects of the film which are fantastic, which is why mm. this film is so insidious. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Because it's because it's wedded to this ideology which completely delegitimizes and deconstructs the Crusades mm. through a superficial sense of presentism, hence the title mm. of this stream, The Perils of Presentism. And just to, to go back to that scene, uh, there were, again, elements which were completely real. For example, um, 
uh, when he says, you know, a king does not kill kill a king when he does, you know, uh, kill uh, Reynaud de Chatillon. That is very true. And this is Salah al-Din fulfilling his vendetta, which he proclaimed was the raison d'etre of his conflict, to uh, bring Reynaud de Chatillon for justice for ostensibly breaking the truce and for not killing Guy. Even the little detail of uh, the king passing, being passed the water and then passing it on uh, to Reynaud de Chatillon and Saladin commenting, I did not give the water to you. Because the idea is that had Salah al-Din given water to Reynaud de Chatillon, yes, he would have brought him into his hospitality and under yeah. his protection. All of this is true. So again, just to emphasize, the writers know the history. They're just deliberately omitting anything which yeah. goes against their narrative, which makes this so terrible. I mean, that's what we talked about before we came on, because I mean, with this one, you can't chalk it up to simple ignorance. There's no. there's, there's will and there's intent. There, there and is will and there's clearly... evil intent. <laughs> yes, I mean, it, it, it's it's an American sort of cultural imperialism um, of, of the worst kind. Well, well I, again, I, I won't necessarily say that. It's definitely a, a, a lefty liberal fantasy. Uh, John Lennon's imagined being superimposed on this period. Mm. I'm not sure whether John Lennon, Lennon, uh, Lennon can be considered. Well, maybe he can be now considered I, I, to be I the, think, the vanguard of American. Well, well, I think what we can return with is that rather it's John Lennon's Kingdom of Heaven, uh, Kingdom of Jerusalem, rather. Kingdom <laughs> of know. Heaven. Yeah, well, they're literally Kingdom yeah. of Heaven. Uh, yeah. I mean, going back to Tiberius, and this is another very telling quote. Um, after seeing the devastation, of course, they were prophets. They knew this was going to happen. First, I thought we were fighting for God. Then I realized we were fighting for wealth and land. I was ashamed. And again, that speaks to the interpretation of the Crusades as a colonial venture, divorced yeah. from any sacred idea. And first, as I, Columbus, first I thought taking... we were fighting. First, I thought we were fighting for freedom. Then I realized we were fighting for oil. You know, yes. you know what I mean. It's just and, it's interchangeable and, and, with any and, more. And, 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 a perfect and, comparison. And, yeah. and, and and also, it's a vehicle of uh, you might say, using sort of materialism to to otherwise sully what is a, you know, a, yes. a, an immaterial enterprise, shall I say. Preci pre precisely. enterprise. Precisely. It is. Uh, 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 there's, an in there's an interpretation with the first quote, uh, Europe was suffering from repression and poverty. I hate to use the quintessential Marxist approach here, but the reduction of all these elements to economic relations and materialist goals, I think is very clear in terms of coming out here. And again, yeah. the wonderful thing is imposing this view anachronistically onto the skin suit, which is Raymond of Tripoli, when, of course, of all the figures who could be seen to be ambitious and coveting his position, advancing his own role, advancing his own uh, dynastic domain, Raymond of Tripoli is one of the most pertinent examples. Yeah. Um, often, again, acting against the interests of the Kingdom of Jerusalem to serve his own ends and coveting the regents, uh, regency. It, for several times, he was regent again and again and again. And yet and, he's disgusted and he goes off to, um, was it Cyprus or something? And that, say, yes, and that to... never happens. It's, it's, more, yeah. it's, it's more dark than that. He goes to Tripoli, as, as I mentioned, and dies soon after. And thereafter, Raymond has been accused of, because his greatest historical patron was uh, ally was William of Tyre. William of Tyre dies in 1186, who so is no longer alive to defend him. So with uh, William of Tyre, his greatest ally and chronicler dead, uh, Raymond is now accused of everything from cowardice to fleeing the battle, to betraying the cause, to converting to Islam uh, before his death. And we will never know. We can only conject as to what Raymond's interpretation was in fleeing to Tripoli. And, uh, and again, uh, the idea of you know, given the option to convert to Islam, uh, it's interesting. But the, the, going back to Reynald, there's one tiny sort of thing which is also omitted from the film, which I think puts Reynald of Chatillon in a good light, just, just so I remember this and I don't forget this, because he was never given an option. He takes the water, he drinks it smugly, showing contempt again for Salah al-Din, with no hint of remorse. However, he is given an option by Salah al-Din, which the film does not give him. He is given an option to convert to Islam or die. And in response to the idea of converting, he would rather die. So all throughout this film, his religious sentiment is mocked and he's betrayed as a brute, lout, warmonger, drunk. And any opportunity to show his, his, his feeling on the subject yes. is studiously and he would, avoided. And he would rather die than convert to Islam, which was something omitted from the film. Just, just leave that there.
And again, and again, it's one of those things where if they had left that in, it makes them a far more complex character, you know? But they can't have complex characters. They can only have good guys, caricatures, and the sympathetic opponents who aren't really yeah. the enemy. Because yeah. the real enemy now is Heraclius. Salah al-Din is just... They're just misguided as to why we're fighting the Muslims. There's no <laughs> real reason why we need to find them at all, because we'll, we'll, we'll get into the, the siege now. Because... Um, we'll, we'll, First of all, this isn't accurate because Balian, after the battle, is shown to make a conscious decision to defend Jerusalem. I wonder why. We later find out it's to defend the population. Why he simply doesn't march the population out of Jerusalem and abandon the city is beyond me. Because <laughs> that would have made much more sense rather than having the population in there and then having it be besieged. No, let all the refugees in there then declare that your goal is not to defend the city but to defend the population. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's so stupid. <laughs> Um, but again, uh, Heraclius, um, you know, suggests abandoning the city and the population, which again is another historical inversion, because Balian had retreated with Raymond to Tripoli, and he was given leave explicitly by Salah al-Din, Balian of Ibelin, to return to Jerusalem only to rescue uh, Maria Comney, his wife, uh, the Queen Dowager, and her yes. immediate retinue, and, and, and not to take not, up um... arms. And was not um he, he was officially absolved of this oath by the um the patriarch by Heraclius yes Heraclius not only absolved him of his oath but Heraclius along with Sibylla who again Sibylla who enters into a deep sort of depression and takes no part and even sort of doesn't want to be seen mm. by Balian of Ibelin no these characters implore Balian as the highest ranking noble in the city to lead the defense so complete yeah. contrasting with the film where heraclius wants to surrender wants to give up and flee and abandon the city to his fate heraclius is the one who implores balian to lead the defense not the other I mean, way it's around just, it's shocking it's shocking and the only reason they're doing this is to make i mean every, church, evil. every he, churchman in the film is a bastard and it's he's the disgusting. final antagonist he is the, he's the final antagonist of the film and this is where we've got to the really egregious stuff i mean if you think we've only gone over a bit <laughs> of it i mean it's also important to note that they don't mention at least in the film that uh they lose the true cross ostensibly um the crusaders had captured the true cross which had been used to crucify jesus when they captured jerusalem and mm -hmm. this cross was used as a battle as a battle sigil whenever the main crusading army was in battle and heraclius reluctantly gifted the crusading army the true cross to go into the battle of hattian thereafter saladin captured the true cross and later its fate is sealed when we have the massacre of Acre during the third crusade but nevertheless little things like that historical relics and things that would actually matter to people of the period and christians in general completely omitted uh, there is no reverence for relics. There's no reverence for holy objects, holy sites, leading to the, the quote, which I suggested at the beginning, where we have your holy places lie over the Jewish temple. What is more holy, the wall, the mosque, the sepulchre, who has claim? No one has claim. <laughs> and then, no, but claim. then even more egregiously, he turns around and says, um, we, you know, speaking about the Christians, we have given this offense. We yes, have given this offense. Did the Muslims on the sack of Jerusalem? The <laughs> no know? one alive, no one alive participating in the siege gave the offense. Oh. We fight over an offense that we did not give against those who were not alive to be offended. Because, idea, because God forbid you care about something that happened before you were born. I mean, it's idea, this idea that we're just, just, just these it's extreme. individuals. We're not related to the past or the future. No, deracinated it's, it's global citizens. It's, yeah. it's insufferable. But again, an offense, the idea that the conquest of Jerusalem was an offense to these people. Like I said, if he said this, he would have been lynched. He would be yeah. lynched today. It doesn't matter. It's the <laughs> same situation in Jerusalem. If he went on an anti-Jewish tirade or an anti-Palestinian tirade in the city, it's the same thing. I think, again, this is the, the very warped modern uh, politics that Ridley Scott is trying to put across. See, it's really, we should really be talking about a two-state solution in Palestine. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is his, this is his, this is his manifesto. And again, Heraclius, who says the very reasonable, justified feeling that everyone in the all, everyone listening to the speech should be thinking, this is blasphemy, burn the witch, burn the witch. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, he is shut up. He is seen as the outlier, um, even though his remarks are completely justified and again balian reiterates his his raison d'etre for defending the city despite but, but, the fact I mean, again... th th this happens like three or four times in this whole sequence of the siege and i find it absolutely infuriating because 
the writing takes, I mean, it's not great, but the writing takes an absolute nosedive. And uh. the reason why it takes a nosedive is because they use um, um, the Patriarch as essentially just a, 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 whipping, a boy. whipping boy for Balian. Yeah. And there's this scene, again, inspired by, you know, these these egalitarian feelings. Oh, I can where, quote it for where, you. Um, uh, where Balian we knights you know, all the we have no knights. Well, first of all, there were knights in Jerusalem. There are about 30, not many. But 30 knights in Jerusalem yeah. is still a quite a significant amount, given how few knights there were. But but nevertheless, Heraclius is demonstrating these antiquated elitist conceptions of having, you know, requirements to be a knight and believing in the idea of, you know, old hierarchy. Of course, in a medieval setting, that is completely verboten. Yeah. Um, so instead, Balian proceeds to knight the entire city's garrison and Heraclius responds by saying, who do you think you are? Will you alter the world? Does making a man a knight make him a better fighter? And, and then Balian... he turns around and goes, yes. No, there's a, there's a pause. There's a pause. Everyone, everyone looks at Heraclius. It's like, it's like a really Scott. And then this was the moment. Clapped. This is the iconic moment in film history where he says yes and all i can think is why you've already <laughs> deconstructed everything so why heraclius would believe that making a knight would make him a better yeah. fighter but balian with his postmodern deconstructionist views on christianity and his weird conception of him as the perfect atheistic knight would have no reason mm. no justifiable reason to believe that making him a knight anyone a knight would make them a better soldier can i can i, can I moreover more more of what just, i think just to say just a sec just a sec Columbo, i have to intercede here moreover this is doubly the humiliation ritual for heraclius because the it's man servant, that he then yeah. proceeds to knight is the hand servant of the patriarch, and he does it in front of him. Who's, who's Sorry, smug, who, who looks gleeful yeah. as he mm, looks at the yeah. humiliation of his father. They, again, mm. it's just the complete humiliation of the patriarch. And mm. all what I, I find I, I, most I, remarkable is not necessarily Balian, it's how everyone yeah. in Jerusalem is going along with this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, this yeah you were saying looked at This man would be looked at like a sort of, you know, a freak, essentially. But 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 mm. the the interesting point is, as you say, everything has been this deconstructed. Everything has been torn to bits. But there's still this um, reverence paid to the knight, and it's I think the reason arbitrary. why that well, yes, it's it's this puerile and childish thing of well, the average movie goer they might not give give a shit about how to be a good Christian. They might not give a shit about history, but knights are cool. You know, it's that it's that idea of we'll just keep knights <sighs> as again this atheistic sort of cool fighters and that's all the there is to it. there's Mark nothing else suggested. to understand you know yeah we can appreciate samurai for their dress and the cool aesthetic but we can't actually appreciate anything which motivates them exactly. or justifies their existence and the interesting thing is again they know their history they know that this happened in a completely different way from that was illustrated in the film because Villain. Balian Villain. did because Balian did conduct a mass knighting he knighted 60 squires already training to be knights mm -hmm. so again interpreted as a moment of desperation to steal their resolve in that particular situation rather than a revolutionary moment to try and deconstruct the notion of christian Ex exactly at least, the knighting, at least the knighting of the squires is not beyond the realms of plausibility if it was no. fiction was not well they would have all been in noble blood and as you've said they hadn't that's training, my I mean. that's exactly. that's my point like it's an entirely plausible scenario under a specific instance of duress which the siege of jerusalem yes. obviously was absolutely and that's why you take that moment of history the actual mass knighting and you pervert it into something which is a complete a complete rejection of the entire medieval worldview um to shoehorn your message into the film and again in contrast to this, Heraclius being seen as the dogmatic defender of, uh, again, as one of the religionists. I, I'm not using the word Christian or Catholic mm. because they're not portrayed as Christians. They're no. just portrayed as religionists. Um, Heraclius implores the stripping of all of the Christian monuments of anything that can pay anyone to fight the, again, out of pure desperation. Um, Heraclius does everything to try and save the city of Jerusalem. And again, he's portrayed as convert to Islam, repent later. <laughs> You've taught me a lot about religion, your eminence. It's just, yeah. like, like he, I said, he's I think, made out to, He's made out in the end to look craven despite his zealotry. Well, he was, already, he was already craven to begin with. Mm -hmm. And this, this yeah. harks back to the portrayal of Michael Sheen's priest. It is this dogmatism, this cruelty, 
this ability to defend the norms of medieval civilization combined with insincerity. It's a consistent trope with all of these characters, whether it be Guy de Lusignan, Reynaud de Chatillon, the priest at the beginning, or Heraclius. They're all the same character, mm -hmm. repeated, yeah. and wearing the skin suits of different historical characters. And then, and, and then we and, 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 disgusting. And, and, and the sense that, like with most things pertaining to shall I say, historical Christianity, certainly a Christianity that, that predates the Enlightenment, shall I say. You know, a, a Christianity where they're sort of embodied in, like, the, the late Roman context for anyone who's watched um, the King Arthur movie from the uh, mid-2000s or in the case of Kingdom of Heaven, Heaven based in the medieval period, is that there's this sort of external splendour and grandeur uh, that is, you know, externally visible with this form, with this Christianity that's being expressed, but then, like, inside is vacuous and hollow and decayed and decrepit. Yes, and, 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 and the people and manifest that as crazy. characters too. And and anyone who speaks freely doesn't believe in it. You know, yes, that idea. Yes. It's just it, it's like exactly. there's sort of there's Soviet peasants who are afraid of speaking out. You know, it, yes. exactly right. And then whereas yeah. on the other side, I mean, you know, once they once they come to terms, Saladin is portrayed as saying, "I oh, we'll, we'll get there in a second. There's there's one point I want to bring up, um, but it, talking a bit again about them knowing their history, uh, because we. The, the, the process of the siege of Jerusalem happens very much as it did historically. Um, the defenders fight valiantly. They're able to hold off and inflict massive casualties on Salah al-Din for six days rather than three portrayed in the film. Um, Salah al-Din, again, attacks a weak part of the wall, uh, breaches the wall, and there is a massed ensemble fighting in that uh, breach in the wall. Mm -hmm. And the issue for the defenders is actually paying anyone who's actually prepared to go into what is certain death and act of the vanguard um, during the wall breach. And it's here where we come to Sibylla because there's a very strange uh, process which she undergoes where she crops her hair and she mm. enters into this sort of state of um, living martyrdom. Um, it's something that actually happened en masse to the defenders of Jerusalem because the interpretation was that God was visiting his wrath on the city and that the in order to spare the city from God's wrath, and again, spare the kingdom of Jerusalem, the entire city had to undergo penance. Of course, it's very easy to admit this in the film because all of the population following in Bailey and Avibelin's um, uh, mold have now become radical deconstructionists and don't believe yeah. in God or the value of the city and wouldn't care about uh, you know saving the city and trying to avoid God's wrath because they don't believe in any of this nonsense anymore. So it's all admitted. And instead it's focused solely on the atonement of Sibylla, supposedly again, for her inviting this calamity by not mm. doing anything in opposing Guy de Lusignan or actively facilitating that. But nevertheless, historically, this cropping of the children, these barefoot processions around the rule of Jerusalem, you know, this, uh, this sense of, again, living martyrdom existed in the air of Jerusalem and existed historically in the accounts which the uh, which William Moynihan was aware of to produce this film and he localized it on the one figure who had a non-religious motivation for undergoing this penance yeah. it's I insidious. wonder um, I, I wonder if um it, you know in the real world if the people at that time um you know I, I surely must have at least some of them must have had it in their mind of the first sort of siege of well not the first but um the siege of jerusalem under titus um where of course uh, similarly the city was you know yes. swelled with many refugees um so i i wonder if there was um, um that was playing on people's minds it'd be interesting to to read well, the there are two motivating factors. One is the the sense of the actual impending apocalypse. Yes, and yes in, bo in both cases, God, uh, God's judgment is also um, um, paramount. Yes, and the other one, of course, is the temporal fear that the Muslims are going to do to the Crusaders in kind what the Crusaders did to the Muslims mm. back in 1099. So all these are legitimate concerns, but again, all of this is relegated in the film just to Sibylla. And Sibylla, again, in, t in terms of the film doing her a disservice, Sibylla was a effective queen who formed part of the essential triumvirate with Bailey and Avibelin Very and savvy with woman, Heraclius. Yeah. So unlike in, the, unlike in the film where it's all Orlando Bloom, all the credit goes to him. No, in the historical account, it is a joint effort between Heraclius, Bailey and Avibelin, and Sibylla. And again, they, they reduce her, they make her into this pathetic caricature, almost mirroring, as you, uh, I think it was Marcus you uh, talked about earlier, um, the fate of his first wife at the beginning of the film. Mm. Um, it's, it's tragic and depressing. Opposite, and, yes. 
Uh, sorry, mm. well, sorry, Columbo, if I if I overlooked you, but uh, coming oh, no, back I'll to survive, your, don't worry. Coming back to your point on the surrender, mm. because we mentioned Heraclius's infam infamous quote: "Convert to Islam, repent later." Of course, Heraclius urged Balian to surrender the city to prevent a forced conversion of Christians to Islam. The, the complete inversion. Opposite, yeah. th this is this is what I mean. That they have to know the history to know what to invert. In well, yes, because it's literally an exact inversion. It's, it's I mean, a it pure inversion. Um, and of course, to prevent the enslavement and you know rape of the women in the city. So they are forced to negotiate the terms of the surrender. And what happens is overly sympathetic to Salah al-Din. Surprise, and, surprise. And again, Balian, Balian to Salah al-Din, I will burn Jerusalem to the ground, everything that drives men mad. And this refers to both Muslim and Christian holy sites. Mm. So again, this is him taking a completely deracinated irreligious perspective on this and looking at this as a contemporary and again any position any man in that position would have been killed by his own side for suggesting that very thing uh whereas historically balian did threaten to destroy sites muslim holy sites yeah. Yeah. um not christian holy sites of course and it wasn't for this motivation of destroying jerusalem as an idea uh, which appealed to an again races of all sides, which apparently no, it was again, destroying the, it as a Muslim idea. It, you it want was destroying this, it. No, it was destroying. Nothing. No, it was destroying it. Well, again, in the film, the, the idea is he's destroying Jerusalem as something which can potentially bring about interreligious yeah, yeah. animosity. That is the, that is the <laughs> basis for his argument. Uh, whereas historically, again, it was to bargain for the lives of the people, the Christians who are left, by again threatening the uh, the the. The sanctity of the Muslim holy sites. However, Saladin, unlike in the film, where again I will offer safe conduct to every Christian in the city. Every, and no, not on, just every Christian, every soul. Every every soul. every soul. On hearing the massacre of the Muslims in the first uh, siege, I am not those men. I am Salah al Din. Well, mm. that's not what happened at all. Salah al Din would only accept the unconditional surrender. And again, there was a political motivation for this. If he was seeking to make compromises over this, it would have weakened his own credibility yep. and his uh, respect for the Muslim populations. So he demanded unconditional surrender. And the way that they got around this uh, demand from Salah al Din was that the Christian population would surrender unconditionally and they would be ransomed and they couldn't yeah. pay for the ransom only of the catholics there were around twenty thousand catholics in jerusalem at that time and after taking all the silver and the gold bullion out of the churches the crusaders could only save some seven thousand um but there, included... but there were um there were some signs of of generos generosity on behalf uh, of, of course one, one, of one, one of course, thing, um there are there are two things which come to mind the first is that there was a sort of um as opposed to counting individually, there was just a flat rate for the poor um, of a set of a set uh, a set fund, which um, yeah. uh, went went a long way um, towards free, um, um, you know, giving safe passage to a lot of the Christians. And another thing which seems to have been done out of politeness is, and again, remember that the ones who weren't paid for um, were enslaved. So you know, yes. Saladin's not this, um, you know lovely guy who's he's made out to be but he did as a sign of respect i suppose to bailey and give him 500 slaves who i assume were then freed again immediately yes released as again. A and, sign of, um, and he was he was true to his original promise he didn't he um, was he, was. he didn't uh, invite reprisals on Balian for betraying his promise not to take up arms against Salah al Din. Um, he was given his original um, proposal, which is to rescue his wife's court and to take her to Tripoli. Uh, Sibylla did not marry and return to France to become a blacksmith's wife. Um, she returned, she was given leave by Salah al Din to visit Guy de Lusignan, who was imprisoned by Salah al Din in Damascus because they loved each other throughout the entire process. And she would remain by his side up until her death in 1190. Wait, 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 wait. So you're saying that he wasn't paraded around on a donkey with a dunce cap? No, he was in Damascus at this time. <laughs> I know, I know. And uh, Heraclius retreated to Antioch and again was an integral part of the Third Crusade. Mm. Um, again, accounts give the impression that the Crusaders were happy uh, and motivated to see Heraclius uh, join in the Third Crusade with Richard of Lionheart and Philip of France. Uh, I wonder why after the betrayal of him in this film. <laughs> uh, I can't understand it at all. And again, in fairness to Salah al-Din, he didn't invite the wrath which the crusaders did originally he spared the church of the holy sepulchre 
um, and turned over the Christian administration of the city to the Orthodox Ecumenical Patriarch as part of a deal with the Emperor uh, Isaac Angelos um, in Constantinople. Yeah, and, and again, it's, these, it it's these actions that um, won him help the respect facilitate of people like Dante as well. And help, um, and also help motivate the hatred of the Latins towards the Greeks as well, yes. believing them all to be conniving and you know, backpedaling, dealing with um, um, them what, and one undermining point, one them. Point, one point as well, which I would bring up, um, and again, if I get anything wrong, because you know, you're far more well versed in this area than I, but um, there, there there does seem to have been some sort of rapport um, historically between Balian and Saladin, in the sense that I'm pretty sure it was when um, Richard the Lionheart came, um, just at the beginning of the Third Crusade. Um, 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 once he was reconciled, Balian almost served as a go-between, yes, um, um, a, a sort of dip, a diplomat um, between the. The, the Muslims and the Christians, um, which which some uh, some people actually thought was inappropriate. Um, so I just wanted yes. to I just wanted to bring that up as well. Yes, no, uh, that that's exactly what Balian does do. I mean, in the film, um, obviously the Crusader states are reduced to a rump. Um, the map on the right here indicates the the decline of the Crusader states. Balian returns to France to become a blacksmith, having learnt nothing, um, having proven decisively that uh, one cannot achieve or find any value in the Christian conception of the Crusades. You can only one find it in getting a new hot wife. <laughs> yeah, one needs to, one needs to, well, she's depressed now, so I wonder how, you know, uh, mm. depressed and uh, emotional short for hair. the first mm -hmm. time. And uh, so, so I wonder how much of a happy ending that is, because she doesn't look very happy in France. I mean, I wouldn't be if I was in her position. Yeah, yeah, for, yeah there's no colour in, in all of France, apparently. <laughs> yes, so he returns to the dulcet, nihilistic misery of being a blacksmith in apparently a village where everyone hated him to begin with and wanted him to leave. <laughs> yes. um, and Rich the Lionheart, of course, knows that this man is actually Balian of Ibelin. He invites him on the Third Crusade and, of course, rejects him. I mock your notion of salvation. I mock your crusade, sir. Uh, nevertheless, of course, that didn't happen. He joined Richard the Lionheart on crusade. And as you mentioned, not only was a military commander serving in all actually the entire campaign of the Third Crusade, reconquering a large part of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, but not Jerusalem itself. He also acted as a diplomat and a go-between between, between Richard of Lionheart and Salah al-Din. So again, the, the but again, the whole purpose of the film, like I said, is using Bailey of Ibelin, the man who surrendered Jerusalem historically, as a conduit to surrender Jerusalem religiously metaphysically mm. to mm. abandon the idea of Jerusalem as a sacred holy site to bring about this new version of John Lennon's Imagine where there is peace and there is nothing to drive men mad as mm. quoted in the film. Um, so there is a reason for that. I mean, there is a, a another sort of history YouTuber. I watched his channel a long time ago, History Buffs. Um, and he oh, yeah, I like him. Yeah, I his main him. his main contender, almost almost focusing very single mindedly on this issue, is the character of Balian of Ibelin being a fish out of water story. And I think, as we've proven here, that's not the problem. The problem is that the whole basis of the film is not that he's a fish out of water in order to introduce people to the Crusades. As an no, he's a that. weapon. He's a battering he's a, ram. He's a weapon against the Crusades. He is there to deconstruct and destroy the idea of the Crusades taking the cross as a legitimate means of salvation. Therefore, he, he, him being a blacksmith, a fish out of water, is essential. It's not yeah. something which <laughs> takes away from the film. It he's, is the he's, film. <laughs> yeah, his, his character embodies the revisionism and the debasement of the actual historicity yes. of the crusader period i would Precisely. say also um, um that's something that would appeal to the american audience it's like all right what will you be you'll be a blacksmith he's a small business owner you know it's just it's just trying to get it's brave by. heart yeah. all over again isn't yeah, it yeah yeah exactly you can't you can't have a man of noble blood no it's interesting no, that i'm surprised game of thrones did as well as it did considering nearly all of them were nobles <laughs> anyway and of course the raison d'etre why this film exists Nearly a thousand years later, peace in the kingdom of heaven still remains elusive. So take heed, audience of this film, of this idealized, non-historical projection of peace um, on the ecumenical liberal basis that I, Ridley Scott, have projected into the past. Yes. And try and work in your own lives to bring this about in our contemporary political setting, which is informing everything I do with regards to this film. And that is it. That is the Inshallah. end of this bloody film and hopefully i can never watch it again because like i said i i don't remember i don't remember hating it this much no. your, <laughs> your, your your powers of baseness have grown yes here is the question uh columba 
Braveheart or Kingdom of Heaven? Oh, well, I've got to go with my people. Uh, you prefer it or you hate it more? Oh, I, I, I love Braveheart. I, I, I will say Braveheart is good fun, whereas this film, I, I would say I, I, as a film, uh, disregarding the history, I would say that Braveheart is a better film. But I would also say that it's probably less egregious. Braveheart. Uh, th the thing about Braveheart is that it has one central issue. In addition to a bit of the class element and all the historical revisionism, yeah. it's motivated by xenophobia. And the caricature is directed at the English. Yeah. Whereas in this, again, it's an entire deconstruction and rejection mm. of the medieval mindset. But uh, I, would again, say, I would say again, with Braveheart, there is... Um you know you i could see how someone could make the argument of oh well it's sort of it, it, it's the wars against england in the scottish imagination you know there's that idea of Edward yes there is exaggeratedly a... cruel so there... I, I make allowances there that i can't make here yes and i think that's i mean if i knew plus, plus, wait, plus plus it's also mel gibson so yes you know. the pro i mean yeah mel gibson is better <laughs> than orlando bloom i think we can all agree on that uh but yes the point i'd make if i knew I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but if I was anti-historical, if I knew nothing about history and I watched Braveheart, I can see myself enjoying it. Whereas this film, whereas this film, that like I said, there are superficial elements where when I was a child and watching this the first time, I was drawn to the music, the costumes, the score. However, again, the more you actually think about it objectively and with a keen eye and looking mm. thematically through all the implications of all the historical subversions. This film is absolutely insidious. And as a historian, I absolutely hate it because on the one, on the one hand, you claim it's not a history textbook, yet you are deliberately selecting elements of uh, historical truth and subverting them, inverting them to present your own views in the most ham-fisted way possible. So this film is a history and it's the worst possible history you can possibly write. Yeah. It's the it's most... A per and it's a purposeful embellishment and, and, and uh, of events to serve a purpose rather than pray yes. just being yes. it's, a flawed movie. It's, it, it's, it's almost a progressive hagiography superimposed on a medieval setting. And in that case, almost you need to learn this film, you need to learn about this film, and you need to try and understand this film to understand that when you approach history, you do everything that this film doesn't do. You do the opposite. You invert <laughs> yeah. all the inversions of this film. Because like I said, this, because this film really is deeply subversive and insidious. And in terms of its implications, I think there's something deeply unsetting and immoral about it. And I don't mean that to sound flippant. I really do mean that. Yeah. In terms no, I, of I taking... find myself getting very bitter watching yes. it again and i don't just say that I'm, I'm not using this from a christian lens i'm looking at this purely at the lens of, of through the lens of a historian nothing to do with christianity of course my christianity is going to inform some of my views on this but if anything having a christian background allows me to access that mindset in a way that people writing this script could not mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um just just based on your question just for a second because I, I kind of just want to touch on this you know how you sort of ask well more columba explicitly um Braveheart or Kingdom of Heaven. The thing that entered my mind immediately was which movie would Thomas Carlyle prefer? And it's and, and it's and it's quite and it's quite obvious that there's actually, despite its flaws as a movie and its flaws, you know, historically, you know, like the complete absence of a bridge at the Battle of Sterling. As, as, oh, you no, know, definitely instance. Carlyle. Um, I think, but Carlyle would the, love yeah. Gibson's William Wallace far more than Bloom's Bailey and Avibelin. Oh, yeah. Well, Bailey and Avibelin is. As an anti-hero who rejects the idea mm. of heroism in the conventional exactly. sense. Whereas, mm. I mean, the brave heart personified by Mel Gibson could be a Frederick the Great. He could be mm. that that model of the poetic, mm. of the uh, of the virile, of of the great man in history. Whereas, mm. what in contrast to all, I mean, Mel Gibson is very much the driver of that plot. Whereas in this film, again. Orlando Bloom is nothing more than the passive receptacle of the ideas that have been programmed into him, uh, like some yeah. sort of NPC automaton mm. to you deconstruct know, the atmosphere, again, the situation in which he finds yeah. himself. Yeah. You know that quote by, um, by Bismarck, where, you know, um, uh, uh, Willie basically says, you know, oh, there's so many, and it's, the, it's from the um, Fallen Eagle series, right, which we've both watched, where, you know, young Willie's like, oh, there's so many situations to create, so much that we can do, like when you, when I'm, can't a Kaiser, anything, yeah. 
yeah, a politician can't create anything, but only when um, sort of God walks past and he gram grabs at the hem of his coat. Basically, ba Balin is sort of like grabbing onto the hem of the coat and being constantly led through every mini event that occurs in this movie as a as a as a passenger, sort of like gr grimly. Like he's he's this is not master of his destiny. You're quite right. He's passive, but I kind of get this mental image of him like hanging onto this garment rather than driving it in the same way that Mel is driving it as his portrayal of as William Wallace in um in Braveheart, as you know, if if you get my analogy. Yes, yeah, so when when I think the exact quote from Bismarck is, one needs to wait and listen to the footsteps of God sounding through events, then mm. wrestle at the helm of his garment. And wrestle yes. is the key word, not be dragged along. It is to be conquer is. the footsteps yes. of God and to master yes. them, unlike Balian. Uh, exactly anyway, I really right. need to move on to the super chats because we've been yeah, I think it's time. Can, can, can I just one, one last sentiment on this movie? Um, you know, being, I suppose, the resident Byzantist here. What is so sad, and I'll be very brief, but what is so sad is that there are very, very few movies, that very few people willing to, like, uh, would dare to go to this time period, right, and to touch mm -hmm. a subject like the Crusades or, or you know, like, in the, the uh, like, literally only the Turks have made movies about the Byzant Byzantines, and we know why they do that, right? It's, it's, and it's got to yeah. be from their perspective. Yeah. And, 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 and as a Turk, as Turks, is their prerogative to do it that way, right? But there are so few... A bit, a, you know, opportunities to portray this time period, and despite the beautiful set designs, the beautiful costumes, the beautiful yeah. music, it it is this sort of this uh, uh, conduit for this sort of liberal progressive nonsense. And when you look at when they've touched on medieval movies in the past, let's say for instance, you know, um, uh, Charlton Heston did El Cid as a, as an instance, and, and and if you go back further, like in Italian cinema, they actually did a Just, Justinian and Belisarius movies uh, at around the same time in the late fifties, you know. There's so few times that this is done where, say, like Rome and the Republic and the early Empire actually get the odd movie every so often, but yeah. this period never gets touched. And all we can appreciate is the director's cut of this movie. You know, for, for us history geeks who like this time period, like this is all we get. This is our crumbs, and it's so it's so pitiful. Hey, this but is, look, but hey, it, but look on know. the look on the bright side. Once I get my thank you, um, Jake Columbo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what what once I get my teal box through, I will fund my own um, crusader oh. film. So don't worry. Anyway, yes. yes. Well, hopefully this. Sorry, that's episode... my spirit. I no, no, no. I, I understand that, Marcus. And the unfortunate yes. thing is, you can extrapolate that beyond history buffs and say that to all lovers of film who yes. have to witness the superlative production values and the abyss which is writing in the last decade or so. <laughs> but um, yes. anyway. Uh, uh, yes, regarding Theobux, yes, please. I mean, hopefully our analysis of this film has demonstrated that at least we, we understand some notion of how to write a compelling historical narrative in a fictional mm -hmm. setting and what we'd correct about this as hint, an example. Hint, <laughs> hint, hint. So, yes, if you're going to give us, you know, 100 or 200 million to uh, to, to fund some sort of production, yeah, please consider us to maybe just have a prod around for the... I, I listen, listen, with my, I could play a mean leper, okay? That's all I'm saying. Yes, maybe. maybe is, someone... is, 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 is it a leper in the form of um, oh, what's that one from Monty Python? What's his name? Um, and, and Michael Palin, like leaping around as a non-leper, pretending <laughs> to be a leper. In, I, I, in I, think, I, think, I think there's a middle ground. There's a middle yeah. ground, certainly. Pity, pity for an ex-leper. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yes, uh, yes, we yes, Catholics all showing their uh, appreciation for life of Brian. I love it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, yeah. uh, Pelinor White Strake for eight pounds and ninety nine pence. Thank you very much. Evening, AA and all. Um, apologize, I have been less active. Baby coming. Problem we can agree on. Scott and his injection of anachronistic modern thinking. Last jewel is woeful too. Becomes a me too parable. Um, well, I also say evening to AA. I assume you mean AM. Uh, but thank you. He regardless. corrected himself and, below that super chat by the way. And He's like sorry. Lovely. And uh, lovely to um, to hear that you have a baby coming. I hope everything yes, goes I well hope for you. Yes, I hope all goes well. So um, congratulations. I, ha I haven't seen the last jewel, nor do I want to see the last jewel for that exact reason. So thank you very much. Was for... that was that the one about the um um the sort of the the knight whose wife gets gets raped and it's a sort of I, I don't um, know. I've only seen the uh, the trailer. I think it's like a trial by combat or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for warning me off that too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Clearly, Clearly, Ridley Scott 
contrary to popular opinion, is not someone qualified to handle any historical topic. And I include Gladiator in this. AJSJ for ten dollars. Um, please keep up the fantastic work. I do not listen to this channel passively. I usually take a bunch of quick notes of historical figures, events of later study. Looking forward to all that is upcoming. Well, I glad that it can serve as a useful um, uh, resource for you in that regard. Um, thank you very much. Uh, D's bit of rough for one pound and seventy nine p. Good to see you back. I think the last time I saw a super chat from you, I apologise if you have sent one since. Was when we do we did Braveheart, so we're we're getting back all the old regulars. Um, mm. Angry AM is back and is spitting fire. Ooh, woo. yes, I I wasn't expecting to be this angry until I rewatched the film. <laughs> Yeah. I, I was imagining to take a more sedate, sort of theology-focused talk on the, no, on the conception no, like of fatalism, the dragon. On, on fatalism and uh, the idea of uh, the kingdom of heaven being removed from the ideas of temporal concerns. But no, it, it didn't turn out to be like that at all. It turned out to be far more insidious. Look what, than that. look what they've driven you to. I know. Um, AJSJ again for five dollars. Thank you very much. Also, uh, the baseness of the channel, I've been spreading it amongst my Latin mass social circles. <laughs> oh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, we well, will I, take I, that. Thank you, sir. Yes, well, it's about cultivating the right audience, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Um, have a look for uh i don't actually know the currency i assume that's brazil uh but i assume it's two brazilian dollars so thank you very much uh what's the writer's early life section <laughs> um <laughs> find that for yourself but assume what you wish double dime for five dollars money well thank you for money and money is very much appreciated double dime wait is that just all it says money <laughs> yes it's very blunt fantastic uh, Andrew Cooper for twenty pounds. Thank you hey. very much. That's very generous. Another awesome stream, chaps. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Andrew Cooper. That means so much. Uh, Chris uh, Raposo for ten Canadian dollars. Um, also, awesome stream. I love these when we need more of them. I remember liking the movie years ago, but I never knew the history, the costumes, and the yeah, that's how it gets you though. That's yeah, why it reels film, you in. It reels you in. It reels you in, and then it makes you believe that the Crusaders just went around hacking at Muslims because they thought it would get them into heaven. Um, and repent as later. We've, repent later, <laughs> and it shows that yes, all, all the Christians were just dogmatic bastards who didn't believe in anything and just were using it as a a tool for oppression. You know, it's, it's something very again. Uh, I, I, do, I hate to say again, Marxian about it well not it, just not, not just marx i mean it's classic that's classic sort of french revolution um liberal thinking i mean again well, yes i mean it, voltaire it, the whole idea of when it, when he says you know why are we defending the city it's not because this is the most sacred place this is where christ died for our sins it's because we are doing it for the people le peuple you know what i mean it's, it's i would it's forgive the film that. more i would forgive the film more if it wasn't so stupid like he, if he <laughs> yeah. announced if he if he announced that we're fighting for the people, then just lead the people out of the city. <laughs> I mean, it's just so mind-numbingly stupid. You want the historical equivalent, mm. and yet you can't actually contrive a situation in your warped pseudo-historical narrative to make it make sense. I mean, just little things again, like not being able to tell whether this man was the bastard or whether again he killed him and took his sword because you would have known the same information regardless just little things which try and the movie dupes you and to try and make it sound more intelligent than it really is yeah. and all requires is a tiny little element of thought to realize hang on a minute <laughs> there's something fundamentally yeah. wrong here <laughs> um so no it's it's a horrible combination all around in terms of not just the the historical insidiousness of it but also the stupidity and the plot holes in the writing as well and albeit the extended version does add more context to this but again Guy de Lusignan is and is made more villainous in the extended version and like I said all it does is elevate what what makes the film terrible oh <laughs> and also there's that jewel after the siege is finished too which sort of you know makes oh, him yeah, look like yes, yes, we, yeah. oh, yes we forgot that he he makes, to... it makes him look more of a vindictive prick you know so it's yes, like, yeah. oh, oh, the... you've surrendered your roots oh I, I don't like you <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's it's. I hate it. I hate, I forgot about that. Like, how can I? Yeah. There's so I, much. I, to I, I'm sorry, though. He is he is extremely entertaining. <laughs> He's one of the best parts of the film. 
<laughs> I, I actually have to agree. As, as, as much as a caricature, I actually love Martin uh, yeah, Sokka in this movie. He's, he's, actually, he's actually great, yeah. He was sitting at my table. No, I, I do. I do agree. It's a, it's a fun, <laughs> it's a fun character. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, it's like, it's like Jeremy Irons in Dungeons and Dragons. You can just ham it up and enjoy it. And I have no sort of problem with the actors. What do you mean Jeremy actors? Irons in Dungeons and Dragons? There was a Dungeons and Dragons film where he played the antagonist. Oh, really? That's yeah. news to me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> all, all, all I know about is the um I remember I watched a bit of the um the sort of eighties cartoon when I was young. It's about the same time he did this as well. Oh, okay. Oh, so this was before he was Simon Gruber. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I am sorry though, I'm sorry, but it is quite a hammy performance from Jeremy Irons in this film. He's usually better, at least in my yes. opinion. Well, I mean, like I said, I, I find it very hard to relate to the character because again, Baldwin the Fourth, uh you have a lot of uh, historical ironing to do in that character to make him more sympathetic than he really was, and you also have to make him sympathetic with the program and uh, yeah, the, you know, the ideology which has been inserted yeah. into this film. But like I said, there are elements. Edward Norton's performance is one of those things which superficially elevates the film. Yeah, there, yeah, are, there are little moments. American would say that, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, I do believe Edward Norton, hands down, was far superior to Jeremy Irons. So I will I chime yeah. in with those sentiments. Um, I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, so fail a lot for ten dollars. Economically, how were these kingdoms kept afloat? How much was coming from Europe, and how much was local generated wealth? Was trade allowed from the Muslim territories to the Crusader states? Yes, trade was allowed, oh, and there yeah, were yeah. caravans crossing over. But as we try to explain, um, a large part of the maintenance of the defense of the kingdoms, the security of the trade routes, mm -hmm. and ensuring that there was a supply of nobles uh, who were willing to come over and administer the kingdom, and also donate money and was because of the charity networks, and they were charity networks yeah. uh, I mean, established this, this by also the Holy happened, Orders. Um, this happened with Jerusalem around the time of the siege as well. They had sort of um, um, proclamations and a sort of Christendom-wide whip round for Jerusalem. And who, and who was responsible for that? Heraclius. Yes. <laughs> Oh, oh poor Heraclius. actually, actually, just on the Remember. dunking of Heraclius, I, I mean, we probably can't go there because we're sort of in the super chats, but we we actually forgot the scene about the incineration of the bodies. Or did you guys mention that in my absence? No, we didn't mention that. Do you want to talk oh, yeah, about it? Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Oh, well, it's just like another sort of cynical take about like, oh, like the spiritual dimension of what Christians believe actually doesn't matter, you know. It's just another sort of whipping boy post yeah, thing yeah, for Heraclius yes, just, being just, humiliated, just, just... you know. Burn the bodies for entirely utilitarian reasons. I mean, yeah. the, I, I, I sympathize with that aspect a bit more because it is very likely that that may have happened under very extreme circumstances. Perhaps, but perhaps. I, off the top Indeed. of my head, I can't corroborate anything of that happening historically. But it's I mean, the, there's also it's the, there's also it's the, the quota it's the quotation, though. It's the quotation. Um, God understands, and if he doesn't understand, he's not God. We have that, nothing to worry about. Like another, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, another. Yeah. It's very disrespectful. Wait, 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 wait. There's a moment. Wait, wait, wait. There's, there's a moment where this film completely falls apart again. The film begins with the desecration of a Christian burial. And now the film is celebrating a Christian oh, dese a desecration of a Christian oh, okay. burial. Yes. Oh, yes. The more you think about it, just, yeah. the, the, it just it, again, it's insurmountable, the issues with this film. But no, I, I, I forgot about that. No, again, mm. it's taking a completely sorry, utilitarian... Sorry. Sorry to put you on a tangent, but it's actually, I, I figured when you mentioned Heraclius again, it did come to mind, and it's probably an important point. But anyway. Definitely. No, it's a very important point, and all it does is to serve that the film's message is more conflicted and muddled than we already thought it was. Yes. Uh, uh, so fail a lot again for $5. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, says nothing, but has another question for $10. Uh, if the Byzantines would have gained administrative control of the reconquered territories from the Crusaders, could they have fared better keeping them in the long term? Now, that's a very interesting question. Now, the Byzantines did um, regain parts of Anatolia, and they also at one point acquired Antioch briefly. They were able to compel Antioch into submission as a Crusader kingdom. I think one thing that would benefit a potential Byzantine administration over an Outremer uh, system is the fact that there was a larger po local population of Orthodox Christians mm. who would have been receptive to Byzantine rule, whereas very much an element of the Crusader rule was taking again hitherto um anachronistic systems french feudalism mm. and mm. imposing it 
into the Altrim estates. I mean, yeah, Outremer, Outremer beyond the sea. Um, there, I mean, there is an element of truth to say that there was a colonial aspect. Um, there were French people going over there, establishing fiefdoms, counties, even kingdoms. Invariably, the, the Franks, as the Saracens called them, many of the domains, some of them were German. There was a Dutch uh, king of Jerusalem, but uh, the vast majority of the nobles uh, were French, either under the uh, vassalage of Henry II, who controlled Western France, and of the King of France himself, who would, who would later, you know, in the Third Crusade, be uh, uh, Philip II Augustus. It's also, suppose, it's also suppose, mentioned... Um, if it if it reduced fa if it reduced the um you know the crippling sort of factionalism then I suppose it would have been um it would you have been say changed. that though but then the Byzantines are renowned for factions you know. well exactly yeah. exactly That's I mean, why I, mean, I, mean, if... I mean you you have to you have to you know uh, contextualize here that the entire uh, series of events that leads up to and includes the Crusades is. Um, brought about by a battle in which one member of the aristocracy marches off the battlefield of Manticore and abandons his emperor you for know, political reasons. To, but again, political what happens reasons, during this? You know, what happens during the eleven eighties? We see the, the the rise of Andronicus desperately mm. trying to uh, uh, counter the Crusader influence, the Genoese, the so-called Latin influence the, 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 within the, the widow emperor of uh, Manuel Comnenus. Oh, only. Yeah. Yes, only to be deposed by another dynasty, the Angeloi. So mm. all of the issues, factionism you see in mm. the Kingdom of Jerusalem are very mm. much in evidence mm. and have a much longer history in the Byzantine Empire at the moment. Mm. It's something they were never able to resolve. Perhaps ironically, with the with the exception of the Paleologus dynasty, despite the most being the most diminutive, they were the longest lived. Mm. I, uh, strangely yeah. enough, to just to answer that question because the super chat super chat deserves an answer. Absolutely, what yeah. I would have said is what I would have said is that if i think one of the variable if we assume that man's occurred has happened right and the crusade and these uh, the events that lead to the crusade occurs and then the crusade succeeds in capturing jerusalem and setting up these states right and we have this state of play of of this Christus, crusader state existing in Oklahoma, right i think it is contingent upon john to Komnenos living longer, not dying of his wound from the hunting accident in Kilikia, and actually mm. marching with his army into Syria and consolidating yeah. the power and actually ensuring a stronger, um, sort of a unified uh, sense of um, purpose between the Crusader states and the Byzantine Empire. Because I, I dare say, one of my, one of, and this is not a theory that I deposit, a lot of Byzantines feel this way, is that if John Komnenos had even lived maybe five or six years longer he probably would have succeeded with uh if not total conquest but at least partial conquest of anatolia and there might have been something um resembling the like the macedonian restoration under the komnenoi and his succession would have been less ham-fisted would have been more gradual and manual probably would have got such a a, a um a developed such an arrogant street having been promoted rather the last minute above all of his brothers as the youngest so there's a whole there's a whole bunch of events that could derive from that, but I best stop there. Well, this is really a discussion about the Second Crusade, isn't it? And all the implications mm. and the infighting between Manuel Comnenos yeah. and the Crusader factions, which doomed yeah. John, that crusade John II. for so John II. and for so the, uh, the county. Yeah. So um, um, but, and it's ironic that the most energetic crusader in the Second Crusade was the Byzantine Emperor. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Well, no, it's not ironic at all. I mean, if you conceive of the Crusades as something to temporarily uh, restore the fortunes of Eastern Christendom, and the emperor was simply the largest uh, uh, factor mm. in all of that. I mean, mm -hmm. another factor to, to pay in mind, I mean, in terms of how would the Byzantines been able to restore control in the Levant without the help of the Crusades? Well, they would have expected a lot of material aid, altruistic material aid from the West, which would be very unlikely given the political implications. But I, as Marcus demonstrated, in order to launch any serious campaign in the Levant, in order to procure these holy sites, the uh, Komnenoi would need to secure Anatolia first. And it's something that they were never able to achieve under the uh, Komnenoi restoration, even with mm. the Altrima kingdoms established in mm. the Levant. Uh, so I think mm. it very unlikely, but nevertheless, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and one, the one emperor that was evidently most likely to have accomplished that was John II. But of course, his premature death led to that not happening the english loyalist for ten dollars enjoyed the stream it was fulfilling and entertaining uh from a navajo perspective it is plain as daylight that they are pushing europeans and christianity bad islam and arabs good like today well, well again it's 
it's subordinate to the message. Because the Muslims come from a different intellectual tradition, again, this liberal ecumenism comes out of a distortion of Christianity and therefore needs to supersede Christianity. But because Islam isn't part of this, it can be dealt with more sympathetically, especially, I think, I think it's clear to see uh, what Ridley Scott would favour out of the two factions currently uh, contesting control over the Holy Land today. Um, again, someone in the chat will probably find that implication to be based. Um, mm -hmm. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I feel that it's the, the quote we, um, sorry, the quote I mentioned at the beginning um, by Jonathan Riley Smith, I mean, you know, in all credit to his expertise, which no doubt completely uh, supersede mine as a actual his, uh, profound, you know, historian of the Crusades for his entire life. I mean, he died in 2016 at the age of uh, 78. I really don't think that this is Osama bin Laden's version of history at all, um, oh. because it is wedded to a liberal ecumenical world vision that Osama bin Laden would decry and hate. So we have a sympathetic portrayal of Islam, but that's only a component. And I would say it, it is actually it's a, a sort far of, less it's egregious sort of, component. Um, it, 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 it's a sort of neutered Islam, right? That's compliant, and and, 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 and you know the, the the kind of Islam that was um, dreamt up and idealized in that sort of um, in that in that era. You know, I mean, you had the the, the talk shows on TV talking about um, um, you know that's the sort of the genesis of the religion of peace dialogue and all of this sort of nonsense. So um, yeah, it's a sort of a neutered, tame um, Islam compliant to these liberal standards. I'm being mocked um, mercilessly in the chat. Uh, how do you pronounce Navajo? Is it Navajo? I would assume so. Uh, yeah. Navajo. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, Marcus588 for three Australian dollars. Thank you very much. Gladiator, Troy, Kingdom of Heaven, in what order and why? Well, Troy obviously is a. A, 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 a sort of demythologized, yeah, you uh, hammerized, uh, yeah. historicized um, account of what we would imagine Troy would have, you know, been like had it happened historically and not as part of this uh, epic mythology. Um, it was interestingly enough the screenwriter for that uh, was David Benioff. Oh yeah, who mm. was the co-writer of Game of Thrones and many of the problems with Troy from a writing point of view and from a strategic point of view are repeated shamelessly in Game of Thrones, such as having the army in front of the wall in both Game of Thrones season eight mm. and but little things like that. But I mean, Troy, I take it for what it is. It's, it's not trying to be a mythology. It's trying to portray Troy as if it did happen historically. I mean, obviously, um, Achilles is probably a better fighter than you can expect in a sort of grounded uh, reality. But nevertheless, um, it doesn't irk me as much because, mm. like I said, it's a reimagining. I, I don't consider it a, a mythological retelling, nor do I think it's even trying to accomplish that. Whereas for Kingdom of Heaven, um, it is a implicit rejection of everything in real world medieval history contained in something which is supposed to draw people in and be immersed in that reality, which is why yeah. I find it much more insidious yeah. than Troy. And um, where does Gladiator fit into that? Uh, Gladiator is, I would say uh, what I find about Gladiator is it's a rather myopic film. Um, it just focus, it, it takes all the events of what's happening in the Roman Empire and it boils it down to the contest between two men and two conceptions of the Roman Empire. This isn't something which the glad gladiator invented, rather gladiator is simply a, a reformulation of an older film, which yeah. is the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Yeah, um, exactly. the, premise, the premise is the same. It's mm. human boundaries, a, re, a reconsolidated Republican Roman Empire yeah. under a general favored by Marcus Aurelius compared to the conceited mm -hmm. Commodus who was wanting his own glory and wanting to be loved by the people. Um, there, yeah. there are more elements of real history and it is much grander in scope, the decline and fall mm -hmm. of the Roman Empire. Um, in, in that way, that I, I believe stands the film in comparatively good stead. Um, but mm -hmm. again, because of that, because of what it is and the fact that Gladiator isn't actually original, um, <laughs> I find less about it, which fundamentally mm -hmm. irks me because I don't take it seriously. Um, as a history. Yeah, may I just touch on that super chat just briefly? Because um, uh, what I want to say is uh, what what I do owe uh, something to in terms of uh, 
giving credit to Gladiator and Braveheart is that those two movies happen more or less five years apart. And we actually have them to thank for this little kind of, I know King Man goes into this category as well, but this this little rejuvenation, this sort of renaissance we have before, uh, shall we say, entertainment was completely um, bastardized, where movies such as Alexander, such as Kingdom of Heaven, arose out of, you might even argue, make an argument for a movie like The Patriot as well, although a little bit out of the, our time frame that we've been discussing. But um, this, this sort of large-scale sort of epic historical movie did have a, a, a bit of a period in the but, sun. A bit but of... Marcus, all of these films are terrible. No, no, I know they're terrible, but, but, think, but think about no, no, it. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just making a joke. I'm just making a joke. Don't worry. Don't take but, me too seriously. I, I, I mean, but no, but like, okay, they are. But, I mean, they are better movies than what we've had, you know, like in the last five years or ten years. I mean, you know, if I had a free ticket, it's like, do I want to rewatch Wolfgang Peterson's Troy or am I going to watch Ghostbusters? It's like, Okay, I'm going to go watch Troy. You know, oh, obviously, the ashes, um, the ashes of civilization. Exactly. Yeah. But, but but one thing I want to give Troy because Troy is a movie that has been lambasted by a lot of people. And I want to say that I think by and large Troy was a really well cast movie. I love the scale of it, mm. and I love and I mean, of course, I love Wolfgang Peterson because of Dust Boot as well, which is a different. I mean, yeah. it is it is a war movie, but of a diff, very com, almost completely different genre, right? Um, and if anyone hasn't watched it, I'd recommend watching Dust, but it's probably great, probably among the five or ten greatest movies ever made. But um, what I love about Troy is that, again, I sort of made that comparison between Braveheart and Kingdom of Heavens, which one would um, Carlisle prefer if he actually would watch a movie? And again, out of those three, I think Carlisle would probably pick Troy, because what you sort of have is ultimately Wolfgang Peterson hasn't sort of defiled and and uh, and made a mockery of the ideal of heroism. You know, like Achilles is still praised as being a hero. Um, uh, you know, Hector, Banner's portrayal of Hector is is still gallant and valiant and and he sort of portrays like this sort of patriotic um, princely figure that defends Troy on the behest of his father. And to some degree, I, I think, and I know this sounds quite odd and funny I should say this, but there's a, there is a scene in Troy that I absolutely love and I won't harp on it too long, but when Priam, played by Peter O'Toole, and I think it's probably one of Peter O'Toole's, in terms of his later career, one of his greatest scenes where he retrieves the body of Hector and he almost is the first person to have ever made Achilles look into himself and that that um that appeal that he makes uh, to Absolutely Achilles about you know it's, how many how many sons and brothers have you killed Achilles it's, and it's, it's very almost true like to the Iliad. I mean it in is that so sense, true to the Iliad. I, 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 th I think there was there was an aspect of again yeah. sating the rage of Achilles, which is the fundamental aspect mm. of the fact that uh, uh, Brad Pitt's portrayal of Achilles is fundamentally vain and this constant warring of Agamemnon. There are aspects mm. of the film which are rede redeem it, but then there are other aspects which take me out mm. of it. Uh, mm. One line in particular coming from Eric Banner playing uh, Hector, uh, when he's almost, again, uh, contrasting his view on strategy with that of King Priam, um, Priam is talking about the guidance of Apollo. And of course, one thing which the film really wants to get across is that this is not mythology. The, yes. the, the, the gods are irrelevant in this whole scheme. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And what what is the line that uh, Eric Banner uses against Priam? Uh, how many battalions does the sun god command? Now that is yes. a quote from Stalin. Stalin which about the, the Pope and which the divisions. Is the Pope, yeah. How many divisions does he have? Yeah, and that little exactly. things like that completely mm. take me out of it. I, I, I like I said, there are there are, there are redeemable that. aspects. Yes. Yeah, there are redeemable aspects on Troy. Um, if you again, but it suffers a lot from the same problem we're talking about here, which is yes. taking something and completely recontextualizing mm. it. But like I said, it's a mythologized mm. setting, so it's yeah. less egregious in that way. And taking what it is. And one last point I want to make is, and this is a, the, the director's cut of Troy, is, and I, I'm pre fully prepared to call flack, flack in the chat for this. I absolutely love Sean Bean's portrayal of Odysseus. I don't think, despite that accent of his, like being proper Yorkshireman, I love, like, no one else could have played Wiley Odysseus in an English language film like Sean Bean. And in the director's cut, I love when he fools the emissaries and like, King Odysseus, the man drinks my wine and shags me wife, you know. And, and, and then he like the MC is like, oh, this is not the king. And he's like, actually, did Agamemnon send you? <laughs> you know, I know it's I give, this, I, I, I give thing, I, but I love it. I give Troy a one out of ten because the script is not in dactylic hexameter. Again, director's <laughs> cut's better, but anyway, this isn't about Troy, it's about King of Heaven, so we'll stop there. Yes, well, in terms of my verdict on Troy, Troy is tolerable. 
I, I don't enjoy watching it, and I certainly don't have the rosy interpretation that Marcus has. But um, like I said, it irritates me less. I, I think that's where you can really judge my interpretation mm -hmm. of various historical films. Yeah, how much, much, to what extent does it uh, aggravate me? And uh, I, I don't know, make my blood boil. But anyway, on to the super chats, because we keep getting oh, them. Um, right, Bolero393 for $5. Uh, excellent stream until the seminal works of Mel Gibson were slighted. Uh, ah, like enjoying yes. a beautiful baguette, then dunking in it in canola oil, Marcus. Um, I will start with you, Bolero, if you reference seed oils again. <laughs> you cheeky uh, Yes. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize that. And I'm, I'm never going to do The Patriot because, like I said, there is a lot you can talk about with this film. I mean, I think it's been a fascinating conversation just in terms of revealing the complexity of Crusader history, but also in terms of the philosophy of history as well. Mm. Whereas... Uh, the Patriot is just terrible. Although <laughs> yeah. again, although again, I do. It's just Mel um, Gibson and like raging at Anglo's again. Like he just hates the English again. It's so, <laughs> it's so funny. I love William Wallace. I, love, I wish, I wish we were like the Englishman in that film. Like I love the dragoons. They're just oh, yeah, so chads. It's so funny. Well, what's that? What's oh, that man. quote? What's that quote? Um, oh, these these colonials are so inept. Almost takes the sport out of war. Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh. <laughs> although, although although i know it's i don't i, I cannot uh, uh talk about the historicity of this phrase where it's ever been used but there is a, a a term that um uh what's his name benjamin martin actually says in this movie which i actually often use when um you know talking amongst you know people irl and that is in the when they're talking in the, in the continental congress at the beginning there i love the i love the um example where he says um as a retort to whether uh, his state should join the revolutionary war and he says that you know would you rather me choose uh, uh between at one tyrant three thousand miles away versus three thousand tyrants one mile away and mm -hmm. the more that i've been exposed to modern politics the more i believe that analogy to be like earth sh shatteringly relevant yeah uh, KG for twenty dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, colonist coming in late. Was the portrayal of distance good for the film? Have to watch the full stream later to fully ruin the film for me. Uh, distance, you mean the scale of it, the geographical distance. I mean, what's a remarkable thing about the film is that the color gradient changes depending on the location you are. <laughs> um, mm. so the further west you go, the darker, the darker everything is. Interestingly, yeah. France is just a just, swamp, really. You know, <laughs> yeah, France is France is France is actually Spain. Interestingly enough, it's uh, it's actually the Highlands of Scotland. You know, yeah, the Highlands of Scotland in the Carolingian period is not really France. <laughs> I mean, it's the it's, it's, it's the classic sort of um um you know Breaking Bad filming, isn't it? Where the second you cross into Mexico, suddenly everything's bright orange, <laughs> yeah. hot and flies and tumbleweeds. Yeah. Oh yeah, I just yes, thank you. Yes, I I didn't really like really get caught on to that before. Yes, that, that's true. Now to come to think of it, um, and, and, and also like when the characters move from location to location, location, it's like oh, okay, they're in France. Oh, they're in Messina all of a sudden. You know, it's like oh, you know, he's on an island in Lebanon. Like it just sort of happens so quickly. There doesn't seem to be any traversing from one location to the other. That's the impression I get as well. It just sort oh, of well, happens well, instantaneously. Well, there is a major rebuff. If um. Godfrey of Ibelin was mortally mortally wounded in France. He was able to travel all the way to Messina in the southernmost tip of Sicily, um, which is remarkable, thinking about it. So uh, Italy must well, be very close. Well, he could have died in Pisa. I mean, that would have been sort of feasible or Genoa. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. Yes, well, he might, I, he might know, do I don't know. I mean, where was, he, where was he cut? Was it not in the stomach? People can linger on. Can't no, they? the ribs. The ribs. He, he would have developed like, a, like an abscess in the ribs. Mm from an arrow wound mm. and it would have taken several weeks to get there i, I don't know there, there was an aspect of teleportation which um mm. again is a curse of all these films but i hope yes. we interpreted your question correctly and you meant geographical distance um and sorry we will ruin this film for you and i hope we do <laughs> um kg for ten dollars again uh many thanks for the stream on ukraine uh many comparisons with the 30 years war i thought um in terms of the the clusterfuck of it all, yes. I think, yes. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? The English Laurelist for five US dollars. Uh, thank you very much. 
Uh, how do you all feel about the diverse cast? Uh, where they should be any? Uh, please destroy AA on defending Game of Thrones season eight. Most embarrassing. Um, I don't right. mind there being a diverse cast if it's appropriate. That's my only. Yeah, that's my only too. contention. Um, and something which gives the historical atmosphere a certain verisimilitude. This also applies to fantasy settings. So, for example, I've watched some episodes of the Witcher series in which they liberally have very diverse settings in historic medieval settings. This isn't so much a problem in a fantasy setting so much as that it, racism doesn't exist in an atmosphere where clearly something like that should exist. Uh, it's something which you just gloss over, and as a result, you weaken the world building by yeah. not including elements of differentiation between these people. Um, so I, I really think that diversity can possibly seriously improve the quality of your work in a certain context, but in other contexts, it weakens it. So again, it's, it, it's very much uh, case dependent. Um, I'm not really going to... Uh, to weigh heavily on one issue or the other, just so it's appropriate. I mean, one of the worst cases, something which I really thought um, we would tackle, but then it, got, it would defeat me, uh, was a recent series, a relatively recent series called Bridgerton. No, and don't even get me started, please. Please. <laughs> if you want a textbook example of, um, yes, we need more racism, AM, yes, why not? Quote me out of context on that. Um, <laughs> if um, Bridgerton is diversity done badly, that that's all I'm going to say. If you want an example, Bridget, um, Bridgerton is for is for um, middle class Asian girls who read Jane Austen and want to picture themselves in it. Essentially, if, well, the thing is diversity diversity is just one problem in that film. The, the, sorry, in that series, everything is wrong. Well, as far as that, it's, from from what I've been told, it's essentially just bloody soft porn as well, isn't it? I mean, no, it's worse than that. But I, I'm not going to get into it, otherwise, it, the, the effort will kill me. I must say, I'm quite, <laughs> I'm quite surprised that you have such extensive Bridgerton knowledge. Here. It's only through association. I'll leave it there. I didn't ah, choose. Okay, I, I like I this didn't story. I didn't choose to watch it on my own volition. <laughs> anyway, uh, please destroy A on defending Game of Thrones season eight. I have actually suggested to him that we can debate this issue. Either I can go on his channel and discuss it, or he can come on this channel and discuss Game of Thrones, because I will be more than willing to destroy any revisionism which tries to recontextualize that season of Game of Thrones as anything actually, resembling actually, um, good. You could actually give me an excuse to watch the final season, because I never bothered. Good. I mean, you shouldn't have. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is that I was waiting I know... for the book, but it just never materialized. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, I knew that season eight was going to be terrible. I just didn't expect it to be as terrible as it really was. Mm. I was expecting to be horribly underwhelmed. I wasn't expecting to um, despise everything about it yeah. and all those who were involved in it. I mean, I'll tell effect. you what. I mean, like, like I said, I've not seen it, but judging by how you know, amazingly quickly, the whole thing just dropped off and no one talked about it anymore. It's the um, most damning indictment it on bad. it. <laughs> yes, and uh, I don't know why, because AA really should know better. I mean, his background is in English literature. <laughs> well, uh, I don't, well, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, or maybe that's a reason for compounding the issue. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, perhaps. Gold will throw him down. Anyway, she... I'm so sorry. Anyway, KG again for five dollars. Thank you very much. KG. Uh what about the recent German miniseries on the Tudor Bergerwald? I haven't seen it. Is that I I did series? watch that and, and I thought it was decent. Um um I mean don't get me wrong, it's a bit strange because um the you know the Germanic warriors and stuff, they speak modern German, but then the um the, the Roman soldiers speak Latin. Although the Latin mm. is is um very clear, it's pronounced very well, excellent sort of elocution. Is it ecumenical um, or classical? Um, I think it's classical. Oh, sorry, ecclesi ecclesiastical. Yeah, sorry. I was a bit confused. But yeah, it, <laughs> sorry, it, it, I've been it, thinking it, ecumenical uh, this stream. <laughs> no, I know, I know. Um, no, it's it's classical Latin. Um, and it, it, it's quite good. Um, the costumes are quite fun, um, quite accurate. Um, the, the battle scenes are decent. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for some, some sword and sandals, it's, you know, you could do worse. You could do worse. That actually sounds interesting. I, I've, I've, oh, I've only really heard positive stuff about... Uh, that you should both evolve and as I, think, I think it's I, called I, like I barbarians or something yeah that, it is called barbarians yeah yeah, yeah. that would be good be good to check out um yeah 
There's there's a great scene when um you know the the Roman soldiers turn up and um demand tribute essentially and he just starts reeling off this massive proclamation from Augustus. You will bow to Mother Rome, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sounds sounds interestingly based. I wonder whether I should. Yeah, that. it's okay. It's okay. And um, right. not 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 maybe, not particularly maybe, diverse. Maybe. Maybe they can be that uh, our next undertaking and actually not be like a, a, a stroll through the ashes, <laughs> but actually something. Great. Yeah, I, the, the thing is, we can't do too many of these. I think AM would have a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> well, better have a happy stroke than a sad one. I mean, if well, you don't pick your strokes, true, you know, go 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 out go out good, you know. <laughs> Sorry, I meant that entirely euphemistically. By the way, I, just, I just <laughs> literally want you to have a stroke. Sorry, could you? Okay, yeah. okay, okay. I'll take this all in good humor. Uh, yeah. Chris Raposo <laughs> for five Canadian dollars. Uh, uh, God help this panel if they have to review Alexander. Well, the problem with Alexander oh, is, no, um, oh, Alexander. Alexander. is the cen is the central performance that 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 is by by far and away. I mean, yeah. who on earth thought was uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Colin Farrell? Uh, I am not would... watching Colin Farrell play a Greek. Warrior. Do you know what I, I've actually got um I've actually got insider gossip about that film because one of my professors Ooh. was an advisor. Um, <laughs> so there you go. There you go. Sorry, I don't think that boots well for your professor. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. But apparently, um, let's just say that the um uh, Mr. Stone, was the Macedonian but, army. <laughs> well, no, Mr. Stone and certain members of the cast were um not pleased with the advice that was given, shall we put it? Ooh, uh, well, there's there's one point, something I find hysterical about that film. Obviously, Colin Farrell has an Irish accent and everyone around <laughs> yeah. him has English accents, which, you know, it, it's kind of like the situation with um, uh, Tom Cruise and Valkyrie. Um, it's just oh, a weird God. little thing Go which, uh, which stands out, which, uh, again, undermines the, the central mm -hmm. protagonist. Even Come though on, lads, think... just one more month. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds Scottish. You can only do Scottish Columba. But the, the funniest thing I find about that film oh. is that there is a there is a boy there is a there is a child actor who plays Alexander, and they specifically chose an Irish actor. That's what oh. I think so. What? <laughs> so bizarre. Now I'm gonna, because now I'm going to have a stroke. My God. Because. <laughs> I think that was the funniest thing about the film. The I think child has to be Irish as well. That yes, because Colin Farrell is Irish. Yeah. Like I hate to say this, I'm 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 going to sound like I'm going to sound like a typical med here, but you know, at least in Kingdom of Heaven, if it actually has one redeeming feature, right, you cannot accuse them of having portrayed the Saracens poorly, right? At least they've gone to the trouble of casting actors who can actually speak Arabic and look authentically Arabic. Like, is there seriously no suitable Greek person that could have played Alexander or even child Alexander that could like put on an accent? You know, oh, at least wow. in like HBO Rome, aside from like some of the central British cast, like a lot of the supporting cast are actually Italian and they sound authentic in Rome. Oh my God! Okay, Sorry, well, I do love off. I do love Saladin's portrayal, by the way, in this film. Yeah, no, I, 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 I like Saladin too. And I mean, and he, the um and the uh, not Vizier, but you know, like his second, the one played by Alexander Sieg. Like that's also a very good trail too. I mean, I will say what, one thing about um, I, yes. I've not seen Alexander for about four years, but I remember that being a pretty fruity film. <laughs> Well, well, I think that's Very again Greek, all the, shall we say. almost to the almost to the film's credit. Interestingly enough, and I almost yeah, feel yeah. that which which film that came first, Troy or Alexander, Marcus? Oh, oh I got a feeling Troy did because I remember seeing Troy uh, at the movies uh, whilst I was still uh, well, was studying. Good, whereas yeah. Alexander, I got a feeling came afterwards. I got a because like Alexander a makes time. specific uh, association between the relationship between Hephaestion. And Alexander is wow, parallel. So, so they actually, that they between actually Patroclus out, and Achilles, yes. They actually came mm. out in the same year, 2004. Oh, it's okay, interesting, isn't it, it, that you have two completely opposite interpretations of the same event in two films coming out at the same time. Oh, I, yes, of course, because in Troy it says it, they make it out to be his cousin. Cousin, yes, not yeah, his not his potential, yeah. potential love. We got a lot of pushback when I insinuated it could have been... Um, uh romantic when i did that i don't oh, know this why is just, this is just cope though from the people who think that the greeks you know all this is just nonsense i mean it's there you read the sources it was the same it was the same it was, with it, you know? it was the same when you made a uh a non-verbal insinuation on the julian the apostate stream i don't quite remember, I don't remember. <laughs> it was one of our very early streams we've got a lot of pushback anyway 
that this is this is getting too much into uh, into the muck, so to speak. <laughs> Confidential, classified. That that that's no, not sealed. classified. Like you can look, you, you can read the comments. Uh, Bolero three nine three for two dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, Am, would you consider a stream on Louis the Ninth? Well, there was a small component of the House of Cafe stream where we covered Louis the Ninth, but in terms of a specific stream on Louis the Ninth, it's very possible only because I. I very much see Louis the Ninth as a remarkable figure, and I would say a very inspirational figure, uh, mm. given the current predicament we are all facing at the moment. So perhaps for a little ray of light, and also something which, again, the film could only draw some sort of hollow facsimile to of a perfect night uh, within a contemporary lens. But in terms of having something to completely rebuke this message, I think doing a stream on Louis the Ninth and his role in the Crusades, yeah. the later Crusades in Tunis, mm. uh, would be a wonderful uh, antidote to all the darkness which has come out of the man. review of his stream. And, and, yeah, and, and just to buttress Bolero as well, because you did comment just further up as well, he, he, actually, uh, he actually asked, oh, AM, have you done Louis the, C uh, the Ninth Egyptian Crusade? And should I sign up for membership instead of super chatting? And the answer to that is Bolero is yes, and uh, less Sneed oil groping. But yes, do join the channel. Buy a mug. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm never going to sell merchandise. I know. I'm I, I, Sorry. I, I know. I, I, I know that there, there's a line. For, for, I, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think uh, I haven't been accosted yet to start uh, advertising for Raid Shadow Legends. That'll be the day. That'll be the day where um, I know I've made it as a YouTuber. <laughs> oh, goodness me. KG again for $10. Thank you very much. Um, 30 years war comparison, overlay of the religion and states. I thought the recent Iraq war had that too. Uh, distance, how they discussed it, no maps, got until they speak something else, except, yeah. There is um, something very superficial. I mean, the irony is, of course, that presumably they would have spoken something else in France compared to what they would have spoken in Sicily. But of course, the interesting thing is that Sicily, which is where, as we discussed in a previous stream, we actually get the etymology of Saracene, uh, Saracens, uh, mm -hmm. had a fascinating fusion at that time of Norman civilization, Greek civilization and arabic civilization oh, yeah. so in many ways sicily at this time sicily this was even before frederick the second hohen stauffen uh Stupermundi, uh made palermo the center mm. of his empire um sicily would have been a melting pot then the, so the, the idea of a yeah sorry no, no. It, I mean, even Frederick II and Evan Stauffen was renowned for having Sicilian Muslim bodyguards as well, partly mm. so they couldn't be excommunicated by the Pope and turn on him. <laughs> That's actually that's actually quite clever. Well, all I was going to say was the only slight inconsistency with the actual film, the portrayal is that would have made more sense, say, like the end of the scene with the praying, if it was, say, in the South, say, if it was like Ugly Gento or if it was Sidakusa, where there was definitely more crossover between, say, like the, the Arab invaders uh, as, and establishing the um, Emirate of Sicily yes, and Lady Greek. Yeah. Messina being right in the northeastern corner was the far more Greek. Be, um, and the least yeah. likely, exactly, the least likely, far more Greek. And where the land influence started to uh, uh, sort of eke into Sicily and take root was actually on the northern coast. So it, it does, that's the only gripe I have. It's not much, but it's a slight gripe. Yes, it, it, I think that's rather pedantic, though. But, but nevertheless, the it film is. The, the film is wrong. Uh, they would have spoken some Arabic in Sicily, and in that way, Sicily would have been a an interesting conduit. But but yes, uh, there there is no maps. There is no notion of distance. Other things which we should mention is what was another byproduct of the Crusades: the massive expansion and facilitation of the maritime republics and the expansion of their navies, not just to the yeah. Crusader territories, but also yeah. to Greek domains and setting up foreign quarters yeah. in Constantinople. So we see all of this: the growth of trade, the the monastic revolution, um, the growth of this major sort of multinational banking system employed by the Templars, and all of this is forgotten. And the contrast between the degenerate Europeans under poverty and repression and the the Muslims suffering the occupation of Christians on the other hand, I mean, the contrast in the agenda is clear and what makes this film so egregious. Um, right. And, and again, I think Ridley Scott was almost reutilizing the same Vinderbonum aesthetic. Um, KG, 
I mean, he does the same. Vinterbonum is dark, miserable, and there are allusions to the fact that the, you know, uh, what does Maximus say, Russell Crowe? Uh, I've seen the rest of the world. It is dark, cruel. Rome is the light, and uh, everything brightens up as you get closer to the, you know, the center of Rome. So uh, it's something he uses again and again, and mm -hmm. it's something which is very in evidence in uh, Kingdom of Heaven. Last super chat uh, for five dollars. Uh, Be foreigners, brilliant about cultural shock of Viking Age folks, etc. In modern world. Uh, favorite scene, Icelandic actress, Norse cursing a church. Be foreigners, have you heard of that? No, I can't say I have. How, how is it spelled? Be foreigners. I've as in like, been. as in like before and foreigners like squashed together. Yeah. I've never heard of it. Sorry. <laughs> no, neither. But it actually sounds kind of interesting. Mm. Um, no, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all um, I'm all Vikinged out after going to see the Northmen mm. anyway. Mm. Just just two things really quickly want to answer. Chris Raposo, uh, Heston movie, El Cid worth watching. Everything with Heston is worth watching, particularly historical. Um, and nev never forgive er Enrico Dandolo, also an emphatic yes. I, I would have thought as an Italian you'd have had a soft spot. But again, I suppose this is a conflict of loyalties between your Italian mm. ancestry and your Byzantine, Byzantine, Byzantine. Oh, I can't say it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, I do know what you mean. Your Byzantinism. Exactly. Um, yes. Well, yes, but you see, Mar but Marcus is a Sicilian. He's not a Venetian. Yes, but I the have, Venetians. I have, I have yes, Greek but, too. Don't forget. Yes, but the Venetians were the the first child, the first colony. They were the America to uh, Byzantines, England. Uh, um, very true. So, and yes, and they suffered a similar fate, and one mm. overtook the other. Um, anyway, that's it. Uh, thank you all for the super chats. Uh, do yeah. either of you have, <laughs> do, do either of you have anything you want to say before we end this very long stream? Um, I, I think it's been a pleasure. We do need to do more of these, especially seeing as we get such a, a rapturous reception <laughs> from the trucks. Um, I um. don't have much coming up. I mean, we might have a possible. Um, chesterton day coming up possibly in which case i'm, I'm probably going to make a video on um chesterton's views on chaucer he wrote a book on chaucer um so i'm mulling that over um in the meantime um our friend panama hat is working on um the first issue of a new magazine called advance which will have art literature poetry um, and i'm thinking of submitting a few of my own um scrappy productions to that um and then i think um alexander adams who runs bornbrook magazine is also trying to put together a little poetry collection so um wheels are turning uh things are happening and if you like a bit of verse then um yeah keep your ear to the ground marcus um no um i suppose until we get back into uh politeia themed things i actually i i've sort of I did a spate with um, obviously AA a couple of weeks ago. I did like three in a row, but um, mm. uh, yeah, uh, RL's been quite hectic for me, so I've sort of been a bit sporadic. But it was actually wonderful to come back on. I do, um, I do thank you for uh, you know having me on because I um, I did say it was back in my heaven, and I like you. I have good memories watching it when I was younger. Um, even though I did identify the pause back then, I guess it's less. It was less identifiable than when people like us look at it now with the, you know, a bit of a fresh perspective, you know, mm. I suppose you have like a pre and a post Carlisle worldview in some ways, or like a pre and a post, what it, you know, and, um, and you really sort of see how subversive they are. But I mean, in the end, if I actually saw King of Heaven on TV or whatever, I'd probably watch it because I do like the aesthetic. I do like the medieval period and just sometimes, and I, and I, and I want to make this point because we have eviscerated this movie thoroughly is that, uh, you know, don't don't get too doom and gloom about the ashes. Like, you know, if you want to be entertained, you want to watch something for the sake of enjoying it or the period. Watch King of Heaven, I suppose, is is my best thing. Don't don't like Heresy. agonizingly That's don't don't agonizingly tear it apart. Like, whatever, but don't don't take it literally is what I can say. Yes, okay, it might be heresy. I apologize, so, but you know, yeah, just don't get too depressive about the ashes. You know, and right, if you I'm get the chance, go and read the chronicles. You lazy sods. In, in fairness he to the stream, I, I hope we've done a service here. <laughs> I hope... Um, I would agree, agree with that, by the way. Uh, I hope it hasn't... I mean, the point. my point isn't just to depress everyone. I, I hope that uh, we've tried to introduce people to a, a critical lens to understand, again, how to review the films historically. So 
hopefully in that way it has been productive and this is so yeah, i mean it, this had to happen <laughs> it did. i had to it do did. this to this film anyway last two super chats uh one from uh chris raposo for two canadian dollars uh what about scott's robin hood or guy ritchie's lol uh guy ritchie's is better than scott's scott's is terrible um i mean i i don't know why ridley scott has i mean ridley scott was responsible for blade runner uh he was responsible for am i completely wrong was he responsible for um uh alien yeah yes I think so. yes the one uh, with so um, he, sigourney weaver i think like the early ones and did you yes, the then, i can't remember and then uh, is it james cameron who does aliens um but no they he's a fantastic sci-fi director but he is weird i mean it's one almost of the, as if it's, it's almost as if he, he's, an, he's an expert at dealing with periods of sort of um, soulless torment in the future <laughs> um which uh, probably not not coincidental also if you want an insight as to how deeply subversive he is remember really scott the man who did gladiator and robin hood and king of heaven is also the director of thelma and louise so keep that in mind <laughs> I didn't know like that. the ultimate wine mum driving off a cliff movie so <laughs> just wow. keep that in mind. Uh, yes but i mean uh blade runner is also infamous for having no definitive cut as well which is which is mm. kind of a problem i don't know maybe he's the anton bruckner of the uh, directing world that's a very deep reference I'd be very impressed if anyone gets that one um anyone and anyway sorry uh john hawkins for two pounds sorry am another super chat to read well thank you for the super chat reminder of a super chat which i've just read so thank you i would implore everyone to do that that's very useful thank you very much um anyway good night everyone bye, -bye. thank you guys